Good afternoon. I am Ward 4 Councilmember Janice Lewis George, the Chair of the Committee on Facilities and Family Services. Today is April 11, 2023, and we are holding this hearing using the Zoom online platform. The time is 12.01 p.m. Today, we will be receiving public testimony from the Office of the Ombudsperson for Children, also known as OFC, and the Child and Family Services Agency, also known as CFSA. Tomorrow, April 12th at 9 a.m., we will hear government testimony from the Acting Ombudsperson for Children and CFSA Director Robert Matthews. If you would like to submit written testimony for the record, please do so by April 19th. You can email the committee at facilities at bccouncil.gov. Uh, before I discuss the agencies, I would like to provide some logistical announcements for today's hearing. In addition to the Zoom platform, this hearing is being broadcast live on my website at janiceward4.com uh, backslash live. All witnesses participating in this webinar are currently listed as attendees in Zoom. This means your microphones are muted and your video cameras are turned on off. When it is your turn to join a panel for testimony, I will call your name and a member of my staff will change your status to a panelist. If you wish to activate your video, which we prefer, uh, while you testify, you need to click the button in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen that looks like a video camera. There will be a frame that includes a clock keeping your time. Representatives of organizations will be allowed five minutes to testify and public witnesses representing themselves will be al allowed a total of three minutes. When your time is up, I ask that you conclude your remarks so that we can ensure that everyone has a chance to be heard uh, since we have a long agenda today. We will be calling four or five witnesses to a panel uh, and council members will have up to 10 minutes to ask questions of each panel. If you have any issues during this hearing, send a message to the host, which is labeled as committee, uh, and they will follow up with you. Additionally, if you are having trouble gaining access to the Zoom and you have pre-registered, you may email my committee staff at facilities at bccouncil.gov, and they will try to resolve your issues. Uh, the first agency that we will hear public witnesses from today is the Office of the Ombudsperson for Children, also known as OFC. OFC is charged with improving the outcomes for CFSA children by providing independent oversight of CFSA and other district agencies that have affected the lives of children under the law. The proposed fiscal year 2024 operating budget for OFC is 938,000. Today, I'm looking forward to hearing from our public witnesses about some of the budget needs for the office and the interaction so far uh, with this new agency. Tomorrow, I will be hearing from the acting ombuds person and staff about some of the many changes in the office, such as new office space, investigations, and additional hires. We will also hear public testimony for the Child and Family Services Agency, also known as CFSA. CFSA is the public child welfare agency in the District of Columbia and is responsible for protecting child victims and those at risk of abuse and neglect and assisting their families. CFA's CFSA's mission is to improve the safety, permanence, and well-being of abused and neglected children in the District of Columbia and to strengthen their families. CFA's proposed fiscal year bud 2024 budget is $219,392, which is a negative 1.4 decrease from fiscal year 23. The proposed budget includes a 2.5% increase in local funds at approximately $165 million and a decrease of 11.9% in federal grants at $53.2 million. I'm looking forward to hearing from Director Matthews about some of the significant cuts made this year, like Safe Shores, Child Placement, and the Grandparent Caregiver Program. I'm also looking forward to talking about increased investments with Close Relative Caregiver Program and Prevention Services. I'm going to now check to see if we have any members of uh, my committee present. Uh, it looks like no one is here at the moment. And so we will head to our first public witness, uh, which is, make sure you're here, Sheree Greer. Oh, you are here. Okay, great. I see you. Uh, Policy Director of the Children's Law Center. Ms. Greer, good afternoon, and you can begin your testimony. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Chairperson Lewis-George, 
Um, I am Shara Greer. I'm the policy director at the Children's Law Center. I'm also a resident of the district. I'm testifying today on behalf of the Children's Law Center, where our more than 100 staff work with DC children and families, community partners, and pro bono attorneys towards a future where every child can grow up with a strong foundation of family health and education and live in a world free from poverty, trauma, racism, and other forms of oppression. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today regarding the mayor's proposed budget for the Office of the Ombuds Person for Children and the Child and Family Services Agency. At any given time, Children's Law Center represents approximately half of the children involved with CFSA, several hundred children in foster care and protective services each year. Over the past 10 years, the number of children in care has been reduced from just over 1,500 in 2012 to a little over 500 in 2022. This dramatic reduction is due in large part to the work of CFSA in narrowing the front door and building a system that prioritizes keeping families together over removal. We believe that CFSA has the right long-term vision focused on targeting and coordinating prevention services to keep families together. This includes a more flexible service array that meets and supports families where they are, as well as providing alternatives to removal. Therefore, we appreciate the mayor's addition of $920,000 into prevention services at CFSA. Kinship support, close relative caregiver subsidy, and Families First DC are three other parts of CFSA's prevention efforts and all received increases in the proposed budget. Moreover, we are glad to hear that the Warm Line is receiving private funding to start this important resource. The Warm Line is envisioned as an alternative for reporting a family in need to child protective services. Instead, a family or community member may be able to contact the Warm Line to be connected with appropriate services or resources. While we're happy to see that private investment has been secured for this, the Warm Line will require long-term stable funding to ensure its success. We ask the committee work with the agency and the mayor to ensure that there is funding after the Warm Line is established. There are, however, some concerning cuts to CFSA's budget, specifically placement and the grandparent caregiver program. Placement has been an area where CFSA has consistently struggled. Fewer children in care does not necessarily mean fewer resources are needed to support them. Once a child is removed from their caregiver, they must be placed in a supportive home. Ideally, a child will be placed once and stay in that home until they leave foster care. Moving a child from place to place creates instability that leads to further trauma to an already traumatized child. Unfortunately, too many children in youth and care experience multiple placements due to an insufficient placement array. We appreciate that CFSA has been investing in specialized treatment, as well as widening and improving, improving its placement array, including a new contractor for intensive foster care increasing the number of trauma-informed professional foster parents, and partnering with sister agencies to establish a residential treatment facility. These are important and significant investments that must be maintained if we are gonna be able to stabilize placement. Unfortunately, the mayor's budget cuts $4.3 million from placement. The agency stated during its budget briefing that this cut will not impact the placement array. However, we continue to be concerned. A $4.3 million cut more than doubles the reduction CFSA has made to placement between FY21 and FY23. And the number of children in care as of February, 2023 has actually increased slightly. We urge this committee to work with the agency to understand the true impact this large cut will have on securing stable, appropriate placements that meet the unique needs of every child. We're also concerned about the proposed budget cut of $413,000 to the Grandparent Caregiver Program, which provides financial supports to grandparents who are caring for children. It is our understanding that CFSA cut the funding because the projected demand for the program did not materialize in FY23. We, however, do not believe it is prudent to make an immediate cut to the program because of a one-year decrease, especially because until FY23, there was a waiting list every year. Another important prevention program is home visiting. And while we're glad there's no cut to CFSA's home visiting program this year, the program's funding has remained flat since 2019 with no adjustments for inflation. Home visiting is a strong evidence, has a strong evidence base for promoting positive outcomes for parent and young children across different types of families and settings. CFSA's home visiting programs are designed for unique populations, including families experiencing homelessness, domestic violence, a parent returning home from incarceration, as well as programs that focus on fathers, parents of children under five, and younger immigrant mothers. We believe additional money is needed to support this program and grow its workforce. We are therefore asking for an additional $300,000 to be added to CFSA's home visiting program to stabilize home visitor salaries and sustain the program. And lastly, on the Office of the Ombudsperson for Children, the funding for that office has been maintained, which we are pleased to see because it is important. This office has a critical role to play in the shared goal of moving from a child welfare to a child well-being system. Over the current fiscal year, the office has worked to build a strong foundation focused on collaboration, service, and accountability 
to foster improved outcomes for CFSA-involved children and families. The office is still in the early stages of building itself in this new agency, including hiring new staff, establishing necessary practices and procedures, and we are pleased they have the funds necessary to continue this work. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I welcome any questions. Uh, thank you so much for your testimony um, and all the work of the Children's Law Center and the work that your staff uh, across the Children's Law Center does every single day uh, for children in the District of Columbia. Um, I want to um, ask you some questions. I, for CFSA uh, tomorrow, I have questions regarding child placement, um, but I just wanted to see if you could talk a little bit more about how a $4.3 million cut will impact CFSA-involved youth. Uh, from the perspective you have as, as a, a provider and someone who, who services these youth and their families. Well, thank you very much, council member. Um, we, 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 we attended CFSA's budget briefing um, and we are still having questions about exactly how that cut is going to impact the placement array. Um, because as I mentioned in my testimony, CFSA has been working hard to sort of stabilize placements and bringing in professional foster parents, for example, and a new contractor for intensive foster care. These are not inexpensive programs though. Right. And as I mentioned in my testimony, fewer children doesn't necessarily equal less resources, particularly because a lot of right. the children who are coming into care and who are needing placements have significant needs. Um, a lot of them are have significant health, um, behavioral health needs. Um, many of them are teenagers. Um, um, some of them are parenting teens. And these are foster children yeah. who need specific supports um, beyond just you know a traditional foster parent so we we really have further questions about how we can make that significant of a cut without impacting the current services especially given that the population in care has not really decreased significantly since 2021 yeah um yeah i i agree with you and i, I think there is going to be a, a, a impact if it remains as is um and we and we have to make some changes here uh, with the council having this budget, but I am interested in hearing from CFSA on that tomorrow. Um, you spoke a little bit about in the beginning about the warm line, and I just wanted to see, um, I just want to want to hear from you what what's going to be important in standing up this warm line and why a continued investment is going to be necessary um, for its success. This is a very sort of innovative and ambitious project um, that the city has taken on, which we are very excited about. Um, we have been part of it was the uh, Thriving Families uh, Working Group. Now it's the Keeping DC Families Together group um, has been working on trying to think about how to create a child, child well-being system um, and really focus on prevention services and moving upstream. And an important part of that work has been creating a system where families can seek help without being afraid of losing their children. Right. Um, and where people are looking for support. Because right now, so many people, people are afraid to contact CFSA. Um, CFSA is not viewed as a welcome <laughs> uh, person really in any family's home. Um, and what the idea of the warm line is to create a system where families themselves, if we can build up that confidence and trust and okay. members of the community can reach out where families need support and help. But it's not a situation where the child is in immediate danger or they need to be removed. Correct. Right. The families that are suffering with housing instability, food insecurity, um, you know, families who are struggling to get appropriate winter coats for their child. Those are the kinds of things that shouldn't lead to an investigation by Child Protective Services, but should lead to the family being connected to resources. And it would be nice to have a place where a family could go to one resource, as opposed to having to contact five different agencies looking for help, because that's really difficult and frustrating for families. Yeah. So that's the idea. That's going to create work of interagency coordination and obviously some money, and it's great that private funding has been secured for that, but philanthropic dollars don't usually last forever. And if this is gonna be a success, we're gonna to need to also invest in resources and okay. ensure that the different agencies connected to the service are actually also adequately resourcing their support for it. Correct, I, I think this is such an innovative idea. I think it's necessary. Um, and I agree with you in the long term, you know, while we very happy about these philanthropic dollars, we as a district have to be considering um, how we are going to sustain this in the, as a government. And I, I think it's absolutely necessary. And this is what we hear. This is what I hear most from so many, um, from educated, from, from, from educators to 
families to parents saying there's no sort of in between. Um, there's nothing there if a child is not in the neglect system or not in the juvenile justice system, um, but need that support and help. Uh, so it, it is my mission to really make sure the warm line, the work that we're doing is going to be successful and sustainable and that the government is going to be truly invested in, in keeping this because I think it's going to make an overall difference uh, for everybody and even the agencies that interact with those, those families. Um, one thing you talk about in your testimony is also um, our home visitors uh, and, um, you know, uh, we, you talk some, some about the workload, some about salary, um, you know, what is it, what is it necessary? Why is it necessary for us to really address the, sort of the issues we're seeing with, I mean, not issues, but home visitors are leaving because they're leaving the field in numbers and they've built relationships um, and, and the impact of ending, ending those relationships early uh, can have um, on, on our success uh, with, within servicing families and, and children. Yeah, I mean, it's, we, we have testified both at, at performance oversight before you council, council person, um, as well as, as before the, the committee on health about home visiting. It is such a powerful evidence-based program where if you can have a home visitor who can really come in and provide the supports, the outcomes in terms of, you know, better parenting, more successful outcomes for the kids, better outcomes for the parents is, is well established. But what we have seen and, and from the report that was done by a lot of the providers of home visiting is that because the salaries are low and because the funding has been inconsistent, it's been really difficult to keep the program in a strong and um, consistent uh, service delivery uh, model. So because um, sal grant amounts aren't stable, funding has stayed flat, providers can't pay enough to, to re retain people and service providers get burned out. And so we're just really trying across the board, both between the CFSA as well as the DC Health Run Home Visiting Programs to try and, and increase the salaries enough so that we can keep workers and keep it keep workers attracted to the field. Because um, that's just been a consistent problem, and particularly for the programs that CFSA runs. That's right. I mean, they're, at such, they're targeted to such unique and important populations that could really benefit from supports. Um, we really want to make sure this program stays strong um, and have the resources necessary to provide the important services. Yeah, and you, I, so you're asking for an additional three hundred thousand to be added to CFA, CFSA's home visiting to stabilize the home visitor salaries and sustain the program. Um, and so that's something we're going to be looking for for all the reasons that you stated about why it's important for us to uh, to have that continuity within our home visitors program and, and to take care of our home visitors, uh, for, for that reason. We appreciate that council. And I do want to say too, that's, that is also part of the, the larger under three DC coalition. Um, we had sort of collectively come together to support that because as a group, we believe it's an important investment for families. And I want to ask you if you could talk just a little bit about sort of your, uh, work uh, and thus far and your interactions with the um, Office of the Ombudsman for Children um, and sort of uh, future wise what what we can continue to do better to make sure we are performing and and having a strong start there. I mean the the initial efforts by the office to you know it, it is a difficult thing to set up a brand new agency that's tasked with trying to actually coordinate across child serving uh, agencies to, to work particularly with, you know, to work with, with families and youth involved with CFSA, but also look particularly at, at um, youth who are involved with both CFSA and juvenile justice. Um, I think that they've made a great start with reaching out to the community. They've done a really good job with working with stakeholders across the city and with the various agencies that they need to engage with. Um, you know, modest first steps, setting up a web page, making it so that um, people who are CFSA involved can currently reach out to the ombuds and seek help and assistance in terms of resolving concerns or complaints or issues with the agency, which was part of the initial vision for the ombuds person office. Um, we really look forward in the coming year that they have the initial enough support to be able to do what they're also tasked to do, which is in addition to resolving and coordinating an individual family issues is looking at what's happening across the board and doing trend spotting and being able to bring issues to the council and to the mayor about what are ways in which we can improve how we are serving these children and families and improve outcomes um, for, for all the families across the system and where are areas of potential problems and where are areas of success. Um, so 
you know, it, it, again, we are only, they've only been up and running for less than a year. Um, mm-hmm. So we're really looking forward to, to them continuing this work. And, and I hope, I hope we come to performance oversight next year with their first reports in hand to be able to talk right. about um, the insight they've been able to provide um, yeah. and the transparency they're able to provide in terms of power serving examples. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, thank you so much for your testimony um, and your detailed testimony and, and very, um, very needed and reasonable budget um, ask. Uh, and so uh, we are going to get to work on that uh, and look forward to asking uh, questions uh, of our government witnesses tomorrow. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, Councilperson. Um, we will now hear from uh, witnesses for Child and Family Services Agency. Uh, I just want to note Ms. Greer was testifying both on CFSA and OF, uh, 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 OFC. Um, and so uh, wanted to make sure we got both of those testimonies in and had a longer period of time. Um, we will now hear from our further witnesses for Child and Family Services Agency. As a reminder, public witnesses will receive three minutes to present testimony. Those speaking on behalf of organizations will receive five minutes and subsequent witnesses from the same agency will receive three minutes. Um, with that, I will call our first panel of public witnesses. Uh, we have Kimberly Perry, Executive Director of DC Action. Uh, Nisa Hussein, DC Action. If I say your name wrong, please correct me during your, your witness period. Thank you. Uh, Ralph Belk, Deputy Executive Director, Program Administration in the, Na- the National Center for Children and Families, also known as NCCF. Uh, Cheryl Brizit Chapman, Executive Director of NCCF. Uh, and that will be our first panel of, of witnesses. Uh, Ms. Kim Perry, if you are here, please uh, raise your hand um, so that we can promote you. And Nisa, because you are here, I'm going to ask uh, one, one, good afternoon, <laughs> and two, uh, you can begin your testimony. Good afternoon. Um, great. Well, good afternoon, Chairwoman Lewis George and members of the Committee on Facilities and Human Services. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and for your ongoing support for DC families. I'm Nisa Hussein, Early Childhood Program Manager for DC Action, Chair of the DC Home Visiting Council, member of Under 3 DC, and Ward 1 resident. Today, my remarks will focus on the critical role of CFSA's early childhood home visiting programs, and we're asking for an increase of $300,000 to the current home visiting grants at CFSA in the FY24 budget. This modest investment will allow programs to raise home visitor salaries and better meet the needs of families. As you know, home visiting is an evidence-based, preventative, two-generation approach to supporting expectant parents and families of young children. Research has shown home visiting to reduce child abuse and neglect, improve maternal and child health outcomes, increase increase school readiness, and improve economic self-sufficiency. Like Shara mentioned, uh, CFSA-funded home visiting programs often focus on specific populations with complex challenges. And later in this hearing, you'll hear from the incredible team at Mary Center's Father-Child Attachment Program who focus on fathers and masculine caregivers. Other programs include the home visiting program at CFLS who work with parents experiencing domestic violence or homelessness and informally incarcerated parents. The Family Places Hippie program focuses on Spanish speaking families with children aged three to five who are low literacy or from marginalized communities. There are a few other services available that offer a holistic source of care for families dealing with such challenges. Much of the success of these programs come from the trusted, long-standing relationships that home visitors build with families. However, home visitors are leaving their roles due to low pay. With an average salary of around $44,000, many home visitors cannot afford to live in the communities they work in, and some have to take second jobs to provide for their own families. When home visitors leave, the services to families are disrupted and the meaningful relationships they developed are cut short. Programs need more funding to raise wages so that home visitors are better compensated and recognized for their invaluable work for the community, and so that families continue to receive quality uninterrupted care. While we are definitely relieved that the CFSA home visiting programs remained in the proposed FY24 budget, these programs have been historically underfunded and have not been adjusted for the rising inflation rates. 
A $300,000 increase would be a worthwhile investment in stabilizing the workforce and allowing programs to focus on their operations for families. This is an issue that we're also exploring with DC Health um, home visiting programs, and we hope to create a stronger early childhood system across the district. Our dedicated workforce appears at these hearings year after year to describe just how valuable this work is, and we're hopeful that the FY24 will be the moment where families and home visitors are prioritized by the district. In closing, we ask the DC Council to deepen investments in CFSA home visiting programs to continue this critical work of supporting and strengthening families. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify, and I welcome any questions. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your testimony. Um, it looks like next on the panel, we have uh, Cheryl Chapman, Executive Director for NCCF. Chairman Lewis George and members of the committee, I was hoping that my deputy would go before me, but it's okay if he goes after. Well, I don't uh, see him. If, if you see him, can you have him raise raise his hand? I just don't see him. So I was going to just keep. I, I don't see him either. Okay. Uh, I did talk to him. He said that he was on, but I don't think the tech. Oh, here he is. So can oh, wait, you we mind, see. do you mind now, if, if he goes? Well, no. First? Yes, absolutely. He can go first. Thank you so much. I was, uh, we didn't, we hadn't, we didn't see him at first. So yeah, appreciate um, you. Thank you. Of course. Good afternoon. How are you? Good afternoon. Glad you got me on. <laughs> That's it. Absolutely. Good afternoon, Chairperson Lewis George. Uh, my name is Ralph Belk. I am the Deputy Executive Director uh, with the National Center for Children and Families, uh, a nationally accredited uh, Child and Family Services Organization incorporated in 1915. NCCF is pleased to continue its partnership with the CFSA as a primary private provider of family-based foster care to 250 of the district's children and youth placed in NCCF's care in Maryland, as well as their siblings and uh, families. NCCF is excited to have played a critical role in partnering with CFSA as the agency successfully exited court oversight in 2022. Uh, NCCF has shifted from child uh, welfare uh, to child and family well being uh, with our reformed uh, family focused uh, initiative, with our tense focus on birth family engagement and community engagement as well. Now, with that uh, refocus uh, in FY23, we have right-sized uh, our program. We, our contact was reduced uh, from 300 kids to 250. Um, as a result, uh, we had significant uh, reductions this year in personnel and placement uh, costs. But as uh, the number of kids in care have uh, reduced or have um, decreased, the acuity and the need of our young people continues to increase. Uh, NCCF serves about 44% of the youth placed in care uh, in, the, in the district. Um, however, we have experienced with this proposed budget a 6% um, cut that we cannot uh, at all uh, sustain. Um, this year, we've averaged serving about 280 children um, and youth uh, each month. Um, and uh, of those, we've, this year we received 149 referrals from CFSA. Uh, most notable about those referrals that 44% of these referrals of children and youth have, who have disrupted from CFSA resource homes in the district. Um, these youth who have already been in multiple placements before coming to NCCF, uh, which reflects uh, the city's uh, instability as it relates to keeping these kids in the district. Um, it, Madam Chairperson, I've included other stats regarding our referrals in my testimony. I won't have time to go over them. I want, what I want to jump to is looking at the profiles of the youth that we serve. As I indicated earlier, the needs continue to increase. Youth have experienced layers of trauma and abuse which manifests itself in challenging behaviors and mental health needs that must be addressed. Um, this requires continued investment in culturally um, specific services and interventions targeted for youth and their families, in addition to supports and incentives to foster families that provide care for them until they achieve permanency. So I've included a sample of some of the challenging cases that uh, the FBI team deal with every day. Don't have time to read all of them, but I won't share maybe two of them. Uh, ET, is a 15 year old African American male. He's been in care since 2016. He's been in and out of abscondence for the entirety of his time in care. He's refused to remain in foster care setting. After many arrests and encounters with the police, ET was found detained and has been placed in youth detention center since uh, January 2023. Um, while there, he's had 17 aggressive incidents, 
uh, towards staff. They include spitting at staff um, and assaults. And it also has a um, health uh, uh, condition that's transmittable that has not been treated that will have long devastating effects for him. My second example is uh, MR, who's an 18 year old African-American female that's been in care for half of her life, following the incarceration of both of her parents and the subsequent relinquishment of guardianship rights of a parent caregiver while she was only in elementary school. Uh, during her time in care, MR has over 30 placements um, and the, these disruptions result from physical um, and extreme verbal aggression, absconding, sex tra trafficking, and community violence and fluency. Um, and although on probation, uh, she continues to, to, to violate and refuse uh, treatment and drug testing. And Madam Chairperson, these are just two examples. I've listed about seven others. Again, this is the work that our team uh, engages in each day. Also for um, the record, Madam Chairperson, I included just the unfortunate uh, uh, passing of our clients over the last year. You see four birth parents uh, and two young people. Again, it speaks to uh, the work of our social workers and our support team as we address and meet the needs of our kids in care. And the family also included, just to show uh, the committee, the outcome. So not only have we right-sized, not only have we dealt with challenging scenarios, but we have provided uh, produced outcomes. Kids are achieving permanency. We performed well on our quality service review as indicated by Director Matthews and uh, his leadership team, uh, really have performed well in engaging uh, birth parents uh, and both moms uh, and dads. Uh, you see our indicators, our success in engaging community uh, and in supporting, providing support services for our young people. Uh, so in closing, um, NCCF continues to evolve. Uh, we are informed by evidence, informed by data to implement best practices. We serve youth and out-of-home placements and their families. We have right-sized our program. We have been responsive to our CFSA partner, FFI, this team has uh, performed and we have designed an approach to engage birth families with success. It, it's working. So then why force NCCF to do more with less? Uh, why force regression? Um, this is not the place uh, to cut as it impacts vulnerable children and families of the District of Columbia. So again, thank you, uh, Chairperson uh, Lewis George, uh, for this time to provide this testimony. And I do hope you get a chance to look at the full uh, written testimony to get a great idea of what uh, this FF team, which is a great team, has done uh, uh, this year to serve vulnerable youth and families of the District of Columbia. Thank you so much uh, for your testimony. I have some questions at the end of this panel. Sure. Um, uh, next up, we now have Cheryl, Cheryl yeah. Chapman. Thank you. And I'm just gonna kind of cap the implications to, for your oversight. Uh, Chairwoman George, because I'm very happy as executive director of the National Center for Children to be here and express all concerns. We've been in partnership and you have my report, so I'm just going to cap it and catch up on the time Ralph took. Um, we have been in partnership with uh, CFSA under Director Donald, now Director Matthews, since 2017, consolidating all these private agencies into this effort. It's been stressful. It's been under duress. We have changed and we've never come before the council saying, can't do this, can't do this, because the cut is 6% of our contract. And we have stabilized uh, at, the, you heard 280 children per month. We're not, we're not, we haven't been, re we haven't seen a big decrease in what we're doing. And we, you already heard 44% of the referrals from the city have bombed out in the district. So these kids are already coming. We're kind of like the last effort. So we take in the high intensity behavioral issues. Um, but 33% of the cuts for placement, that 4.37 million, 33% of that is, is us, is NCCF. And that's just, we don't understand. Um, we don't understand because we sought parity over the years and, and the vision was parity of quality service either side that the children are being served. So when we look at this, we have no fat. So we can't, we can't cut what CFSA can cut. We don't have anything but this really refined, and you see in my report, it's a fabulous mission. We're so excited by the model practice. We've learned the hard way with support from CFSA, a model approach, we think, and we've seen the impact. However, here's our reality now, and I'm gonna kind of summarize this. Um, after all of this work as a partner, we helped with the oversight coming from the court oversight because we helped our end of it, um, so 45% or so of great number of the children are in our care, 
But the good news is this. We're now looking at um, 42% of the kids currently are placed with their relatives. And so that means that's a good thing because that number is growing relative care. We believe in it. However, that means more cross-jurisdictional work, more work with birth parents and with community resources in the district and moving back and forth to get to reunification. It's more work, but it's good work. Uh, so what we wanted to talk to you about is this. Um, what do we need? We need the, not, not to get a cut because we don't understand it. It's irresponsible in our opinion because it's working, the model's working, but we do need a modest increase. I can't really, because of the acuity that you'll see in Ralph's report. We need to retain the social workers. We are at full, um, full capacity now with social workers. Unheard of. It's taken us two or three years to get to that. It's been a struggle. It's a national crisis. We've achieved because social workers actually like working for us. But we need a 3% a three percent um, raise for them. The 8.7 CPI, we know we can't ask the city for that, but can we do 3%? We have um, three essential positions real quickly, a mental health therapist, a foster parent coach, an after-hours on-call specialist. We have crazy stuff happening. We need another on-call specialist. So the, again, the justification is there. And the last two issues is a lease vehicle. So we can do the um, McKinney-Vento and get kids to school where they live in the neighborhood. The city can't, seems like they can't manage to do it. Uh, sometimes we have to wait for weeks before. And then we have, lastly, a placement stability incentive. This may be a pushback from the director because they didn't see that this working for them, but it works for us. So we give a $1,500 stipend um, to families who keep the children stable for a year, tough kids. And so you'll see that's our ask. Um, and that's really the basic ask. You'll see the numbers in the report. And I'll just conclude, I'll just recoup. NCCF has no capacity to cut and the children, youth, and families and communities we serve in the district deserve a stable and ethical response. We have figured out how to do this within a downsized model. We should not save the city's budget on the backs of these children and families. We need to not learn how to do it and then pull back and undermine it because of some external circumstance. We owe them. That's why we're being very aggressive in this testimony and that I enjoyed the partnership with CFSA. I enjoyed the professionals in that agency, but this is, we can't do it. We need a little more and we're asking the council to please consider our request so that this can be something that we're all proud of and feel ethically um, um, consistent with our code as social workers. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for your testimony. Where are you all seeing this cut? So, because I, I, I'm not seeing the line specifically, but the budget, I, I see the budget. The cut is in the 4.37 million that they cut from placement. We are uh, 1.4 of that 4.37 million. Got it. Okay. That's what we I was wondering. We're a third of that cut. Okay. All placement. right. And, and we kind of agree with CLC around, we have real concern. Yes. There's some nice initiatives that are coming forward that are proposed, but they haven't kicked in yet. And exactly. I know that Director uh, Matthews' piece is let's be business model, and but a business model does not undermine a quality product <laughs> just to save some money. We still have to do a quality product. We're just learning how to do that. Right. We have changed to a child well-being following the vision of the city. We agree with it and we have changed. Why would we cut it back? So he's got some initiatives that he wants to do, but we that doesn't mean you can cut this. Right. I got that's, you. It doesn't make sense to us at all. Yeah, I got you. Um, and I, I appreciate that. Um, I want to ask a few questions too as well. So um, Director, Executive Director Belk, I, while I have you, I just thought your testimony was, um, one, it was very well detailed and very well written. And I appreciated the examples. I thought that really helped me sort of understand the work that you are doing and how you right. do work. Um, you. It was very, very helpful for, for me. And, and I, I just want to say that I appreciate that. Let Thank me ask you. you this because it sounds like you all are, you know, you deal with a lot um, and a lot of behavioral issues and a lot of things. And it really seems like you are all the last, the last in the system and you sort of get, you know, you, you're dealing with every all the failures that have happened previously, they fall in your lap. I just want to ask you, you know, I'm, I'm, this is a broad question, and, and I mean it well, because I really want to know, based on the fact that you you are positioned where you are, 
where, like, how do we stop children getting to getting to you at this in this you know in this way? Like, what what are the beginning failures that we should really be focusing on at a city is trying to solve? Like, I'm trying to get to the root causes here of like where in that root are we are we are we failing to address issues um and and that's not a criticism of, of cfa i'm talking about the system as a whole yeah where can we do better um in in recognizing some of these um issues that, that uh, basically they just spurred out of control by the time they get to you right can i right. jump in there real quick Ralph, no, you yeah, you're, the, the question is for both of you by the way so so the warm line sounds like something very exciting however my skepticism about that, and I've been around, I taught at Howard for 30 years and stuff, and so I really observe it. The problem is that the agencies, the interagencies, all affect children. Every agency affects children and family rearing. So if you've got disastrous affordable housing processes, mm-hmm. if you've got a lack of uh, substance um, treatment for young mamas who are even pregnant, there's so many, uh, it's an intersect between the agencies. And I think that hopefully the city can, because it's a small city and we think it's a magical size. This is a 68 square mile. We should be able to find some coherent way to not have the bureaucracies develop silos and not yes. intersect. And we and, and we have to be believable. One of the things that uh, Ralph and I talked about, our staff, get engaged with these families. So when they die, when the mama dies, we've been having a bunch of those or a child gets killed. It, mm-hmm. it tears up our team because you have to have a relationship to serve them. So the question becomes stability then becomes important. I got to retain, we have to retain. So the issue becomes are there retention issues of professionals and the rest of this agency uh, says, that have contact? Who are the relationship points for these children and these parents so they can build trust? Black families, and we have 90% of them in our system with a 70% Black population, but 90% of them in child welfare, they don't trust government. They don't trust. So we need to get away from the governmental, the labeling stuff, and be able to have them access resources and hear who they are. But Ralph, you can comment, because Ralph is supervising the people on the line. Yeah, I'll just add that these young people that are in, that I've described, are are not just part of CFSA. So child welfare goes beyond Uh, Child and Family Services Agency. And so these, these kids touch other systems. And so uh, uh, the DCPS, uh, Charter Schools, uh, Department of Human Services, DYRS. And so it really, it really takes uh, the city as a whole to address the needs of kids who are living in, um, in, par- in silos and in, in impoverished communities. And so you really have to look, up, look at the communities where the kids come from, look at addressing the issues of, of, of poverty, um, mm-hmm. And, 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 and even looking at the, this national trend of, of uh, decreasing the number of kids coming to care, really reevaluating uh, those kids that are, uh, are staying home. And, and in some cases, maybe they're staying home too long, too long before they actually come into care. Um, right. But again, yeah. I, I, again, the issue goes be, beyond, I think it has to be a citywide effort looking right. at engaging the, youth. And, but, and but, what there, some of the, but there is something you could look at, um, Chairwoman Joyce, if we can be helpful. Um, if you look at the child fatalities, there is a review process right. for any of those that the family's been known to the uh, city CFSA within five years. And frankly speaking, uh, almost overwhelmingly, the families did not get adjudicated or substantiated, right. but the majority are neglect. But And sometimes the family had tried to do what they need to do but the child ends up dead on the street at 13, right? Mm-hmm. Or 10 or 15. And um, so the question for me is, how do you rethink what is a child welfare concern? We, we right, made it right. foster care. So my point then is, if a family cannot protect their children from the streets and they end up dead in their young teens, there is a breakdown of the family. I don't mean go forward with punishing them or labeling them, but we have to be able to, well, that's not that's not a substantial, they weren't substantiated, that wasn't a report, they didn't do anything to, this is a non-abuse situation, but it's still a juvenile homicide. And I know as a mother who's raised three non-relative children, I'm an adoptive parent, and two, I know that I feel responsible for how they moved into adulthood alive. 
um, yeah, no, able to right. take care of themselves. So how do we help families do that piece without letting it? But there is an accountability issue there. Because is there any way to... for us there? I think yeah. I agree with you. I think there's a yeah. huge accountability piece here. And and I the reason why I found your testimony so helpful, just looking at percentages. Um, as you know, I, I used to be a juvenile prosecutor. I also okay. um, mm. in, in both the district and Philadelphia. And I also uh, served in the uh, family violence and sexual assault unit. So, oh, okay. you, so see, you know. Not, Right, where breakdown is even even greater, um, and I saw that percentage of seven uh, percent of youth display inappropriate sexual behavior, and and piece of that, and that that's a little bit deeper of need and support um, mm-hmm. than we know. I'm looking at the percentages that you all put in. This is page two of, of your uh, testimony, uh, Mr. Bell, mm-hmm. and I wanted page two of your testimony where you do a breakdown of some of the uh, um, percentages. Uh, what I saw, and I want to know if any of these numbers are sort of stand out as um, as as different or ag- of what we've seen previously. Um, I see I see this a lot. Forty four percent of referrals were for sibling groups, and I say that a lot. And even in, within the juvenile context of things, a lot of times we are servicing families. You like there right. is. I mean, I have had instances where I've had three brothers, one sister, one family, but all. All of them were assigned to me because they were one family. So right. getting from this percentage, this number is that we 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 have to service when we have sibling groups, are we servicing them sort of as a fa- as as one family? Uh, and are we seeing the siblings sort of being are siblings getting the same same service and the and sort of same placements, or are we splitting them up, putting them together, splitting them up in different instances? What do we see in regards to, to that percentage and how are we can we do better given that we we see sibling groups are a large percentage of, of referrals? Well, yeah. can I jump in that real quick and then you saw okay. mm-hmm. Yeah, because as an agency administrator, what I see is sibling uh, siblings are entitled to grow up with each other. Right. right. And yeah, and so the, the birth parents are one thing, but the siblings, because they can be with grandmama, one, the aunt will take another one. This one, nobody wants. All right. This kid may be a sex, uh, a sex offender. I would call it sex abuse reactor because I don't believe little kids are offenders. But but there could be different needs. And sometimes they can all be physically together, but sometimes they can't. However, our team must work together and treat them as a whole unit because the goal is they need to grow up with each other. But anyway, that's, right. that's my comment. That's so important. And people need to understand that those siblings will have each other when their parents transition on. That's right. But that's go right. ahead, Ralph. And so, yes, yeah, so you're correct. We, we do serve them as a family. Um, and in all possible, we try to keep, when appropriate, keeping these siblings together uh, if there's capacity for the home and it's appropriate regarding their behaviors and their interactions. Um, but if not, then those foster parents, they're in separate homes. We work very hard uh, to ensure those foster parents are working together. Uh, as a team uh, to engage the entire family, uh, then also to include uh, the birth family as well. Yeah, um, I appreciate that. And I think that's something that we have to see as a as a, a goal is sort of understanding that these siblings are interconnected. Um, and, and a lot of times when their parents go on, they are together and sort of a, a varied degree of, of differences in how their service sometimes does create other issues even amongst the siblings of, you know, well, they have a good foster home. I don't have a good foster home. I'm left behind. They're going, moving forward positively. Right. Well, we, we have we have a quick story yesterday. We had a kid, he's the oldest of 11, and he was a runner with drug runner in Baltimore, and he was doing all kinds of stuff, but he was always smart. He just got a full scholarship to Hood College. Wonderful. And, and he was able to talk to us about what it means for him to be the oldest brother and That's have right. his sibling see, all right? And, and that they can love their mama even though she could not deliver him. That's right. But she loves his mama anyway. And so it's just so powerful to see he went straight to his role yeah. as the oldest brother. That's right. And that's what I mean. That makes a difference and that changes trajectory for young people. Right. Let's, um, I've, let me, I, I'm, I'm so, I, I thought your testimony was so good and we can talk forever. So what we'll do is I'll schedule a follow-up meeting because I really do oh, want to go through um, some of your testimony with you, some of the percentages we see, um, what I, and I do look at the child fatality and I, I saw a 26% of the older youth have, been, have significant mental health concerns, including multiple hospitalizations, mm-hmm. untreated diagnosis what? and suicide or homicidal ideation. Um, <clears throat> 
And I think there's an overall issue across the board with, with all of those instances, especially untreated diagnoses, especially sort of the multiple uh, hospitalizations. And we've seen suicidal and homicidal ideation increase amongst youth uh, right. across the board. And so we have to talk about and do something um, regarding that. Um, and the rights and the rights that these youth have now, um, Chairman George, we can't make them do stuff. We can't make them get mental health treatment. We can't make them take medication. They have rights and they are savvy enough to know their rights because they have advocates who tell them their rights. And then we end up in the caregiver roles like, well, you're really right, not right. informed enough to make that call, but they don't have to. So that'd be a great conversation to follow with you. Yeah, let's let's do that. Um, we'll one do, question yes. about the lease vehicle, um, which I, I know you noted it's 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 necessary to comply with the McKinney-Vento Act, ensuring that youth in care maintain their appropriate neighborhood-based educational placement right. um, while working towards un reunification with their family. And that cost is 15459 I just wanted to know, have you all talked with Aussie about this as well? Yeah, there's there's a yeah there's a there's a uh, a gap when a, a young person changes placements or comes to us for the first time for a placement. Mm -hmm. There's a ten day window before that uh, kicks in uh, if it's Aussie uh, provided or uh, CMC also has a a uh, translation plan as well. But that takes three days before that kicks in. And so uh, for those three days, those ten days, the child okay. still has to get to school. And so we have a position. We have, no, we have a position. Yeah, yeah. So we have uh, three translation positions to uh, accommodate to get those young people to, to school and we need a vehicle for that third role uh, to ensure uh, that again, that our youth as they transition, they're able to maintain their academics and maintain their educational placements. Okay, great. All right, I, I, I appreciate you all's thorough testimony um, and my team and I'm gonna schedule a follow-up meeting because I really wanna talk about some of the ways we can improve uh, accountability and also some of these percentages are alarming and I think there's some ways that we can address it uh, with all of our backgrounds and uh, with your expertise there. Um, Nisa, I want to come to you. Can you talk more about how the home visiting collaboration works with organizations like Mary Center and CFLS? Would the budget increase benefit all the organizations or partnerships? Yes, um, so the $300,000 would uh, go directly for the grants for Mary Center's Father Child Detachment Program, Community okay. Family Life Services, and then um, I believe the Hippie Family Place receives like $50,000. Um, and at the Home Visiting Council, we work with also DC Health funded home visiting programs and programs that have private funding, but we all kind of work together. And so we're asking kind of a separate increase for DC Health funded programs. Got it. Okay, that's what I wanted to um, I'll be sure about. Okay. Um, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I um, and I we've spoke before, and I'm looking forward to hearing um, from some of the on the ground folk uh, as well later in the testimony. But appreciate that. Um, I don't see Kim here, uh, Perry, from this panel. Um, so if she comes later, I will have her speak on a different panel. But I want to thank this panel for uh, their testimony um, and look forward to addressing some of the issues you've noted with CFSA and addressing some of the budget issues um, in the final budget that we pass out of a committee in the final council. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm going to uh, move to the next panel. Um, I see Christophe Cornelius, which is CC, is what we call her in Ward 4. Commissioner CC uh, is here. Uh, I see we have uh, Erica Adams, the executive director for CASA for Children of DC. Uh, we have Felix Hernandez, advocacy and fatherhood program manager. Uh, Marcos Martinez, uh, participant in the Father Child Attachment Home Visiting Program. Uh, and Nandy Burton, Family Support Workers for Mary Center. All right, good afternoon to this uh, entire panel. Uh, Commissioner Cece, we, you are first on this panel, so we're gonna start with you when you get a chance to unmute. And I'm here. Great. <laughs> I will be uh, providing my written testimony officially in your Dropbox uh, later you. this afternoon. But I was uh, at the White House Easter egg roll unexpectedly with three toddlers yesterday. So you can just imagine I'm happy that I survived. Yeah, okay. you know what? Commission, uh, Councilmember Henderson said the same thing when I saw her this morning. 
<laughs> she's like, you know what? I don't think I'm doing that again. <laughs> it's an experience. Yeah. I don't know if I'll do, I'll do it again, but under different yeah. circumstances. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, council member Lewis George and committee members. Uh, my name is Chrysanthi Corniotis, and I'm currently the ANC commissioner of single member district. Uh, for DO4, but I come to you today in my most important role, and that is a foster mom to baby Jay, who just turned two uh, a few weeks ago. I have been licensed as a foster parent since July 2021, and then I've had baby Jay in my home since September of that year. She came into my home uh, five weeks post op. Uh, from um, a heart condition uh, that she was born with. And she was actually removed from her birth home uh, due to medical neglect. Uh, I was originally licensed by the Latin American Youth Center, but was transferred over to CFSA in October 2022, when LAYC did not renew their contract with CFSA. During my almost 19 months of being a foster parent uh, to baby Jay, it's been the most important and rewarding experience of my life uh, thus far. Uh, uh, you know, as I said, baby Jay was, came into my home after uh, medical neglect and uh, she is considered a special needs child. Um, so there's a lot of balancing um, that I, find I have to do, but I'll do it, you know, a thousand times over. I come to you with a few concerns or observations um, in my 19 months in the sense that I've always found that as a foster parent, CFSA has resources available to us, uh, but they're not as consistent as I would say, you know, the resources are uh, focused for the birth parents themselves, and which is understandable to a certain extent. But at the same time, um, as I was listening to the representative from the Children's Law Center, and I also have a law degree uh, myself, um, what I find is that, you know, what is in the best interest of the child. And this, this question differs between each case, each family, each instance. In our case, uh, you know, I'm hoping uh, to adopt baby Jay because that's what I think is in her best interest. And I think that would be agreed with, um, you know, the social workers and her physicians and everyone involved in the case. But at the same time, you know, I also fostered uh, baby Jay's birth mom for about nine or 10 months. And during that time, I would scream from the rooftops, you know, she needs intense therapy. She needs to be in a therapeutic home. You know, she has a lot of potential, but she's been through a lot. I, and to this day, I, I, I say the same thing. And Luckily, you know, nine or 10 months later, she actually is receiving the intense therapy that I think she needs. Um, but again, I, I come to you because I think there's this lack of resources, lack of support for foster parents. And this is hard work. It's not for everyone. Um, but I think that if there's allocation in the budget for specific or more consistent respite care uh, services um, for foster parents, I think that would be appreciated, as well as the fact that um, from a case-by-case -case basis, I would just appreciate, uh, I understand the history of uh, foster care and reunification and so on and so forth, but I think in certain cases, especially of sexual abuse, um, et cetera, that um, adoption should also be considered a lot earlier than it currently is. So in conclusion, I welcome any questions. Uh, I'm just coming to you, as I said, as a foster parent, firstly, today. 
Thank you so much uh, for your testimony um, and stepping up to be a foster parent. Um, I will have some questions at the end of uh, this um, panel. Uh, next up, we have Erica Adams. Good afternoon, Erica. Good afternoon, members of the Committee on Facilities and Family Services. My name is Erica Adams, and I'm the Executive Director for CASA for Children of D.C. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. CASA D.C. applauds the efforts of CFSA to provide preventative resources to avoid uprooting and separating families, but we acknowledge that abuse and neglect is still a reality for far too many of D.C.'s youth. CASA D.C. believes that through increased funding and enhanced partnership opportunities, we can work together to ensure greater paths for youth to thrive. Recognizing the decrease in federal funding that CFSA is now faced with, we believe that there is an even greater opportunity for CASA DC to enhance the services and supports provided to CFSA's youth, especially through working together to receive federal Title IV-E funding. Like CFSA, CASA DC is dedicated to helping DC's youth thrive. For more than 20 years, CASA DC has provided compassionate, trauma-informed, and cost-efficient care to DC's foster youth with proven success. Yet we are serving less than one-third of CFSA's youth. We have the capacity to serve more and volunteers who want to serve, but greater partnership is needed from the agency to identify and refer youth for services. In 2022, CASA volunteers dedicated more than 10,000 hours to mentoring and advocating for DC's youth. More than half of CASA youth met or exceeded academic expectations, eight times higher than CFSA involved youth overall, and 65% higher than DCPS students as a whole. CASA volunteers are having a transformative impact on youth's well-being, an area reduced in CFSA's FY24 budget. 215 youth were supported in well-being last year, enabling 211 youth to demonstrate positive pro-social behavior and communication skills, for 208 to identify and practice positive coping strategies, and for 162 youth to demonstrate improved self-esteem and mental health. While CFSA has indicated that this will be reallocated into other areas, CASA DC can bridge gaps to the support and ensure increased well-being services. Despite our demonstrated impact and array of supports, CASA DC has not been included in the DC budget since Mayor Fenty's time in office. CASA DC has also never received VOCA funding from the district, despite providing case management services to and community education on youth victims of abuse. Nor do we have any formalized contracts with the Child and Family Services Agency, despite the hundreds of CFSA-involved youth we pro provide vital services to each year. A formal contract would allow CFSA to retain 25% of the Title IV-E funds that CASA receives, benefiting both of us, and most importantly, benefiting the children and families that we both work with. We have the capacity to serve more youth and to make a difference in more lives, but strength and partnership and collaboration is necessary to ensure that CFSA's youth are referred for these supports. We implore the agency to consider formalized partnership or referral procedures. Thank you, Chairperson Lewis George and members of the Committee on Facilities and Family Services. We welcome any questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Um, we'll have some questions at the end of this panel. If you can stay on. Uh, Felix Hernandez. Felix, if I can just get you to unmute. There you go. Yes, I'm sorry. I, I was okay. having some difficulty hearing. Okay, great. Good afternoon. Um, um, good afternoon, Chairwoman Lewis George and members of the Committee on Child Family Services Agency. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all as you conduct this budget hearing um, for this committee. My name is Felix Eduardo Hernandez, and I'm the Advocacy and Fatherhood Program Manager at Mary Center, and I'm also a member of the Home Visiting Council. I also collaborate with the Under 3 DC team, um, advancing all things early childhood education and uh, services. I'm here to share some considerations and feedback that focus on home visiting. And I'm also here to um, seeking the, an investment in, of 300K for CFSA workforce retention practices. Many of our neighbors in DC have not been able to access home visitor support and services primarily because of the healthcare and support workforce is seeing an incredibly steep turnover rate. Something that, as we all know, the pandemic has magnified greatly. For home visitors, the primary factor and driver of a steep turnover has a lot to do with a high administrative burden coupled with a salary that does not adequately compensate them for the impact and services they deliver. The interruptions to our services due to low wages have a negative impact on the participants we hope to partner with. 
From October 2021 to May 2022, our team only had one home visitor because <clears throat> when the first two people we offered the job to, when we offered the salary, they took a look at the number that our grant limits us to, and they therein decided it's not going to work for me. Um, many participants have shared with us that they have to work two jobs to make ends meet. I've also had many home visitors share the same. Grant, the grants DC offers for home visiting programs directly impacts the salary amounts that we can offer in our organizations. Many of the challenges participants confront are usually about housing, food, job security, and family well-being. And if I can be honest, in the last couple of years, I've heard home visitors share that they're navigating the, ex the exact same issues they're providing support to. We need stronger investments for a stable, healthy workforce. Recently, the mayor is set to invest 750,000 to refurbish four tennis courts and to pickleball courts, and also $20 million in increases to new police recruit sign-on bonuses that go from 20K to 25K. I'm just sharing this with you as you consider the modest investment we're requesting for home visiting. I invite this committee to make sure that prevention services like home visiting have abundant resources to make thriving wages possible. The work of prevention can positively, positively improve community safety and well-being, where intervention is catching folks in, the, in crisis, in emergency, and at the lowest that um, where policing is an intervention that must be uh, considered. I'm observing how these intervention strategies get more resources and attention, and I would like us to consider how stronger abundant investments into prevention could be where we pour our efforts into. I'm confident that this committee that this committee can find the resources to increase our home visiting grants and ensure a thriving workforce and even higher thriving community of parents and families that we can partner with. I'm confident that prevention is where we can ensure our community is safe and healthy. And as others have said, a healthy and safe society is made of healthy and safe individuals. To conclude, we suggest that uh, CFSA together with DC Health join in strengthening home visiting grants by a total of 1.5 million. And specifically for CFSA, that increase looks like 300K for all home visiting grants, not just the ones uh, relevant to our organization. Um, I'm also here for any other questions and uh, also wanted to give a quick update that um, Marcos Martinez, his testimony will be read by uh, Ms. Nisa Hussein, who is who uh, spoke earlier. So he's a participant that wasn't able to make it. He's in the middle of taking classes. Um, but yeah, just wanted to uh, let you know that that's what's going to happen. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your testimony. Please stay on because I'll have questions for the end at the end of this panel. Um, Nisa, can uh, you read uh, the testimony of Marcos Martinez, who is a participant in the Father Child Attachment Home Visiting Program? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Good day, council and members of the committee. My name is Marcos Martinez and consider myself a hardworking student and parent. I'm also a father child attachment home visiting program participant. I graduated from high school in May 2021 and I'm studying computer science at University of the District. FCA helped me seek child custody in late 2020. I was first connected to the DC multi door court mediation program and FCA helped me find a custody attorney to provide Prove legal paternity for my child. My family support worker, Mr. Jimmy Llanos, has helped me attend school during this time. He introduced me to Generation Hope, which supports my academic goals. Home visiting benefited me. These home visits have helped me enhance my academic performance, develop my knowledge, and identify vital solutions for my professional and personal life since they constantly follow up with me as a student and parent. It also helps me receive aid for any current issues. I'm grateful that I can share my story with you. Even though before I had problems being able to visit my son, little by little, I've been working with my lawyers and with the court to help me get ahead and be able to have my son for longer. I've gone through many bad times and situations of great stress, but little by little, I've been helping myself um, get ahead thanks to all the things I've done. Today, I can have my son at my house overnight now that I get to pick up my son on Friday morning and drop him off on Saturday afternoon which means I can spend a whole day going out with him and that fills my heart with joy for all this time from not being able to do this. After the first testimony that I delivered in 2020, I've made a lot of progress with my situation as a parent. 
I've had the pleasure of helping other parents with the same situation, also in my personal life. I've been able to confront all of the things that have happened to me head on, and little by little, I'm expanding the opportunities I've had as a father after a long time in this program. I've learned a lot to value the time and effort of the people who do it for me. So thank you to all the people in this group and in this organization who have helped me get ahead and be the person and father that I am today. This program helps me locate attorneys to help me with my son's legal procedure when I needed it, connected with other groups to explore new educational options and gave me a chance to succeed. I've benefited most from this program's individualized assistance, which has helped me find calm in the middle of a storm and fulfill my educational objectives. It also helps me when I need to speak up for myself. I know how to do this now. I wish to share how great the support is. Jimmy helps me address problems and manage during home visits. For instance, Mr. Jimmy Yanis has advised me on how to better my academic life and how to best prepare for my future employment. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. Uh, thank you for sharing that. And please, uh, please let Marcos know we are proud of all of the efforts that he's done and, and all the progress he has, has made um, when you have an opportunity. Um, Nandy, I see you are here, but I need you to accept uh, the panelists. So you should see something pop up that says accept panelists. I need you to click on that. I'm going to give Nandy a few uh, a moment. If not, I'm going to start my questions for this panel. All right, I see you. And now all I need you to do is unmute. All right, perfect. <laughs> Sorry, but it wasn't working for me. <laughs> All good. Good afternoon. <laughs> good afternoon. Um, get my testimony. Alrighty. Um, good afternoon. Thank you again for allowing me to speak today, um, Council Member. Um, so thank you so much for providing the time to hear my voice as I speak for myself and other home visitors. They may agree with me. The participants that need my support and my family. I am a single mother too in Washington, D.C., where median income is supposed to be 98000 And the average going rate for a two-bedroom apartment is 2300 For me to be able to obtain a unit, I would need to make nearly 69000 a month, well, 6900 a month. <laughs> my monthly food bill to ensure my daughters and myself have a healthy meal is about four to 500 a month. I also need to budget my car note, car insurance, yearly registration, renewal that is forced on me, and also the child care that is 400 a month for each child. Now that I may say um, that I have, now you may say that I have resources out there like food stamps, TANF, housing vouchers, or the IZ zoning program to be able to afford shelter, food, basic essentials for my family. But due to me being 100 over the poverty line, I cannot receive any of those benefits. So I'm left with a few options. Leave my job that is aimed to support 25 participants to keep them create, to help them create healthy relationships with their child, family, while na navigating the public benefit system or to which dads express what they feel neglected by the city due to the lack of availability and funding of programming for Black fathers and their families. The other option is to work extra jobs that I have to now so I can afford to pay my rent, feed my family, pay my bills, and also anything that comes around, but neglect my responsibilities as a mother because I'm always exhausted from working so much. Not being available for my children because I'm working so much costs me and my daughters a strain on our mental health. It's impossible to live on 42,000 a year in DC before taxes. It's impossible. My monthly income as a home visitor is 2,400 after taxes and health insurance. That's not right. I understand that local grants want to have the most impact with the least number of resources, Recently, I observed that the mayor proposed a 20 million increase to sign on bonuses for new police recruits. 
I can see the strong investment in intervention, but I'm struggling to see the strong inve investment in programs that focus on prevention. As we know, the CFCDC and Kaiser study has shown that people that experience any type of trauma affects them in their adulthood. And so we are causing more people to be stressed out to make them cause or create confusion with their own life or even react in a way that they may not normally do due to the fact of being stressed. How would you feel, council member, if you were stressed out and hungry and had to make a unwise decision because your family are still starving to steal? Wouldn't you have rather it be a support system out there for you to get food versus a police system out there to arrest you for merely trying to feed your hungry bellies of yourself and your children? I will remind you from my last testimony that my role, I offer counsel, inform, and provide individualized education regarding child development, support, and customizing family goal plans, provide public health education, and case management. I deliver all six protective factors by supporting parent resilience, social connections, concrete supports for parents, reducing stress by helping them find housing, which three dads already have found housing without support food resources, clothing, and creative ways to strengthen families and children's lives. We put our participants first and walk with them on this journey of parenthood. We meet with our participants as many times as they need to support them and their children. I sit down to educate families on how to nurture the development of their children. The list go on. I have many roles in one. This program helps fathers immensely. We should also have the budget to provide housing and items, diapers, clothes, rent security for fathers and support their mental health. This is a real program for fathers and their families because our children and the community need their dads. Now we want to continue the American history of keeping black fathers out the home and make mothers work like slaves in order to care for children while creating a cycle of trauma in the black community. Council members, please listen to what I share and others on this panel and do your part to change this story. I believe the solution is to keep this work sustainable that within my purpose is to increase the investments by 300,000 for the CFSA home visit funding. If the mayor can find 20 million to police people, to police our community members, <laughs> I'm certain you can find 300K for strong work or more for strong workforce retention practices that focus on prevention of child abuse and neglect, prevention of child abuse and neglect. Healthy, thriving communities deserve to have home visitors like myself that can rely on for support. DC grants must strengthen the investments that they make so that organizations have the funding to ensure thriving wages and maternal benefits in a sense of that our neighbors are in need of. Strong prevention investments make for a far safe environment that just intervention and policing programs cannot do. Thank you. Did I go over my time? Oh, you're good. Oh, okay. <laughs> you're fine. Thank you so much for your uh, testimony. Um, I want to thank this panel of witnesses. I want to start with some questions. Um, Cece, I'm going to start with you again. Thank you for being a foster parent. Um, what I think you spoke to is sort of the lack of resources for foster parents. And I wanted to know sort of what, what would adequate support of, of resources for foster parents look like? See, I think <clears throat> um, I would say that it shouldn't be as difficult as it is in a lot of cases to find respite care um, for foster parents because as I said, I, um, you know, I have to travel for work sometimes and I'm lucky. I, I know that I'm lucky because I can work from home mostly, um, but it's also a balance. Um, I think that if CFSA would open up the foster parent network in the sense where we could collaborate or maybe work mm -hmm. together more as a team, as opposed to being sort of stovepiped, I think that would be helpful because I know that I've been told that I'm supposed to be a part of a group of foster parents, but I haven't really been reached out by that group member or group leader at this point. Um, so that's on me to follow up, but 
um, I think just sort of opening up the network a bit more and being more transparent would be a lot, would be helpful. Um, as well as I just I feel as though there's always um, a bit of coddling or because of the the emphasis on reunification of the birth parents and the birth families, but I feel as though um, in certain cases where maybe adoption by the foster parent is on the table that you know we should be included in some of the conversations that are being had earlier on from a legal perspective but i don't you know i understand that we're not going to rewrite uh the foster <laughs> foster parenting you know code at this point but um you know there's just a lot of um as I said, I think just opening the network up a bit more and just having um, the social workers talk to the family support workers more and have that that open line of communication yeah, would be helpful. And I know you were, uh, I appreciate that. Um, and I know you were having a conversation about like thinking about best interest of child and mm -hmm. some considerations. Uh, especially, especially in instances of, of sexual abuse uh, cases. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to hear sort of your sort of where you think we should be. And obviously every, every situation is different um, and you have to analyze it in that way. But I wanted to hear from you sort of what considerations should be, should be talked about in these conversations, especially around those that, um, that really go to the best interest, best interest of the child. I can only speak from my experience, but I, you know, baby J is a, is a part of a family of, as I said, her, her birth mom and also her birth mom's siblings. Um, and from the, from the get go, uh, it was um, discussed or not discussed. It was known that there was uh, sexual abuse in the home uh, uh, by um, a family, a very close family member. I'm trying to be mindful of yeah, the of course, information. Of um, and that family member, uh, we were told, has gone back to their country. But that's not the truth because, um, you know, he posts TikTok videos often, et cetera. And so he's roaming the streets. I I imagine, or I assume, um, the, the social worker has said, oh, I make drop-in visits to the mom's home. And I'm like, but well, you're not making those drop-in visits um, at one or two in the morning when he probably is there sleeping. I think that from a safety perspective, even though birth mom, yeah. and I'm, I'm talking about not, yeah. not baby Jay's birth mom, but the siblings birth mom, um, you know, is doing what's right in the sense of like of checking off boxes in the, in the long run, right. will those children who have been in a foster, you know, a safe environment, they're thriving at this point for the most yeah. part uh, for 18, 19 months. Will that, you know, being reunified with a mom who potentially is still with the sexual abuser, <laughs> um, is that in the best interest of those children? Right. I would argue no, you know. But at the same time, I wonder why is he able to roam the streets when he is a you know, he's right. abused his children. Like that doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. Um, but I, I think from a, from a big picture perspective, when I, when I look at baby J, for example, with all of her health needs and potential developmental needs moving forward, you know, I think every child it should be assessed. Is this, is the birth family or kinship member, or what have you, really capable from a, um, a capability perspective to right. be able to, to care for a special needs child? Do they have the advocacy power in place? Again, you know, and also it's just an attachment thing at this point, like Jennifer, uh, baby Jen thinks of me as her mom, like I've had her since she was six and a half months old. 
I pray every day that, you know, everything, you know, the adoption yeah. will be seamless and, and so on and so forth. And I'm working with birth mom and birth family to make sure that there is visitation, a visitation yeah. plan in place. But I just, I think that at the at base, the safety and security of those children are of utmost, and I know you you agree right. with me, of, uh, you know, utmost importance. Right. And, you know, I just want to make sure that CFSA and everyone has the resources in place to make sure that that's the case, that, you know, and that things aren't falling through the cracks or, you know. Um, Absolutely. So that's what I, I would yeah. say to that. Thank does you. That, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. No, but it, it really does. And I appreciate you, you putting that on the record. And we, when we talk about considerations that we are making, uh, these are the things that have to be considered. And these are the things that have to be at the forefront of how we're making decisions and making sure people aren't just checking boxes because checking boxes is one thing, but what is in the best interest of the child as they grow, as they develop, and as we try to support them to be the best adults that they can be uh, mm -hmm. in their future lives. Um, so I, I appreciate you putting that. Um, yeah, uh, and in, uh, in like in ensuring, for example, one of the sibling, well, most of them, are of a of an age where if you ask them where are you most comfortable of course they're torn because they want to be there for their birth mom and their families but at the end of the day what what makes you happy what will enable you to to reach your potential that's right absolutely thank you i appreciate i appreciate that um erica i want to come to you um uh, thank you for your testimony. You discuss VOCA training in your written testimony. And I just want to, can you talk more about that? And have you had discussions with OVSJG or even the Judiciary Committee around that? Yes, to both. Um, so with VOCA funding through OVSJG, and we've applied several times, and basically the last kind of synopsis for the reason we were denied is that they were focusing on current fundees, which makes sense, but also... Um, there's other programs that are doing really good work um, that like CASA, um, but I'm sure we're not the only ones that that increase funding, but we have um, certainly talked to OVSG, JG and the council over OVSJG as well. Okay. And, and I know we talked about, uh, about this a bit during CFSA's performance oversight hearing, um, but has CFSA given any more updates or explanation as to why it was, has not entered into a formal partnership with CASA? Uh, sort of, can you for the record also explain sort of what is needed to establish formal partnerships with CASA and how the lack of such partnership affects the youth uh, your organization serves? Sure. So we've had several meetings with CFSA before ultimately they said it wasn't worth their time, um, worth the squeeze for getting um, that partnership in place. But literally, we're just asking for them to sign a contract. Um, it allows them to get a quarter of the money from the federal government um, for Title IV-E money. So we would get three quarters. That's just how Title IV e funding works. Um, mm -hmm. And so they would get a chunk of it. And um, and so it seems mutually beneficial for literally signing a piece of paper. Um, we're doing That's the work. That's what I was we're asking. Doing. Like, what's the squeeze? The squeeze is the paper? The yes. signing? The literally. Contract? Okay. That, <laughs> yes. All right. I was right. like, I mean, is there a... <laughs> right. No. Is but it would give them some of the federal funding that they said that is part of why they've decreased. Like, right. Okay. Funding, so... Yeah, it's, I mean, it seems mutually beneficial, and I, if, if if all the squeezes is, is paperwork, um, I, I thought it was sort of like all these, you know, other mandatory things that's before they can get the federal dollars. If but if, if not, uh, then then that doesn't. It makes sense to do versus right. not do. Okay, um, thank you. I appreciate that, um, and, and I'll have some follow up questions for CFSA regarding that. Um, Felix, I want to come to you um, first. Can I, can I ask you something? How do you, how does someone become a home visitor? Um, I'm asking this just because I have people who I think would be, be good to, to become home visitors. Um, yeah, yeah. Actually talked to someone recently uh, who said that they, that they would be interested in sort of a career in, in, in uh, home visiting. So what's sort of the criteria for you all, as far as yeah. um, home visiting, do you provide training, step up training where people can learn to become home visitors? Yes. What does that look yes. like? I just yeah. wanted to get a sense from you uh, regarding that. Absolutely. Um, well, maybe I can speak a little bit about my journey into how I showed up as a home mm -hmm. visitor, and maybe that can shed some insight. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, some of my peers. 
So I have a background in education. I was a pre-K teacher and also a middle school teacher. Mm -hmm. And um, something that was true for me in that context, I, I, you know, to be a great teacher, it takes years. It takes time. It takes learning, mentorship. But there was something that also like was very stark. I could try my best as a teacher. And even if I were the best teacher out there, if something's not going well in the home for one student, that student won't be ready to learn when they show up to the classroom, to that learning environment. And so I realized that, you know, I could be the best teacher, but maybe there's a more powerful impact one can have outside of the classroom. And so before before home visiting, I was a teacher and I found out about this role from a, a mutual friend a couple of years ago and I found myself applying. And um, luckily I got hired and immediately started to receive training. And so b- between my hiring date and like maybe the first two and a half months mm-hmm. flooded with training curriculum trainings like uh the one that i learned first was parents as teachers and there was um there's a healthy families america uh model that used to be offered more generally that i also received um that i uh, was a really a strong benefit to my practice um among that there's also trauma informed training and there's also a strength based training among like options counseling for uh, you know, through the uh, pregnancy period um, and a whole suite of other trainings, actually like domestic violence training that was like a two week long process. So there's a very intensive um, suite of training that has to be delivered mm-hmm. to that for that starting budding home visitor. And that typically takes about two and a half months. And so even if we hired someone you know, say start in January, they won't be able to successfully start seeing families until maybe around the beginning of March because of how much training must be uh, developed for that person to be ready for a caseload. And so, and and this is like tying it back to uh, what I testified earlier with, we didn't have a home visitor for, from October, mid-October to the end of May. That's about seven months. We yeah. weren't able to have new referrals open back up in our direction until August, September. And so almost a full year, right, of not being able to offer our services to families because we were choked by the reality of what a week's salary and the impacts that it has on who we're able to hire. Right. Um, and so I, and so like who can, who's well positioned to show up as a home visitor? anyone who has experience providing support to children and families. Um, We actually, we have people who are, who have backgrounds in communication that Mm -hmm. show up to do this work. We have, I I actually, uh, I I don't, I I can't often entertain uh, people with master's degrees because I know I'm not going to be able to offer them a master's degree level salary, right? Like it's just, I, I, I struggle with trying to bring people on with that kind of level of expertise. And many people with masters end up in the home visiting space as home visitors. That's right. But you don't need one. You don't need a degree to show up in this work just to have like the right kind of experience to focus on families, well-being, public health and children. And you have an opportunity to, you know, receive the training but if there's anything that must be fundament- fundamental, I think, is the capacity to be reflective and mm-hmm. the capacity to um, offer grace in difficult situations. I think that that's one of those soft skills type of, yeah, soft skills that you would need to really show up in this in, in this arena. Okay. Um, and so tying that back to salary, which I, which you, which you already have done, um, part of the reason I asked that is because what goes into training and being a part of it also means the type of people we're able to get. And, um, I think the tangible impact that 300,000 investment you're looking for would have on both the people who, who you are serving by home visiting, but, 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 uh, for, for all of those who are home visitors, um, is is important and I think you've been able to talk about what that what that impact would be um, meaning you'll be able to service more people you'll be able to have more more home visitors servicing our uh, people um, and have have long-term long-term success 
all, all, all around. Yes, I, yes, that is the goal. We, we, in, in my team specifically, we only are able to hire two home visitors. And so it, it, I will say that part of my um, observations is that we are, as far as I know, the only home visiting program in the district that focuses first on the father. We offer support to the father and the family, but our entry point, our focus is the father. And so we're the only home visiting program that focuses on fathers. Mm -hmm. And our team is also the, the smallest out of all the other home visiting uh, part, uh, programs that I've seen. Typically, there's a team of four home visitors that can tackle on you know, a larger caseload, uh, uh, cast a wider net of participants. Our program receives only, only, to, only to be able to hire two home visitors. That's and right. so that's also something that in the future, once we get, you know, more stable, because we we initiated our journey as a program and team at the very beginning of the pandemic. March 2020 is when we first, as a team, started to offer participants open slots to join our, our uh, yeah. program. So it's it's been a challenge since um, March 2020, but we've been trying to show up and provide support in all the ways that we can. And in fact, Marcos, I'm actually gonna, I'm planning to have a conversation with him later today. But right. Marcos was one of those participants we got at that first year, and he's just been a really standout, really standout participant. Really proud of his efforts as well, and I will definitely carry uh, your uh, your message to him directly. Thank you, um, Nandy. I want to come to you um, if I can. Uh, first of all, thank you for your powerful testimony. Um, I appreciate the work that you do and really for this panel and all of our would say, but in, but in addition to caring for the community, you also have families and then you take time to testify here today. It's not easy. And, and I want to thank you for, for that. Let me ask you this, Nandy, because you mentioned something I think it's important in your testimony. We are giving bonuses to a lot of, to, to other people. Um, and let me ask you for the work that you do, what, what, you know, uh, talk to me about sort of how, what difference it would make for you to be able to have an increased salary, um, how would it make a difference in your life, uh, and why is it important for us to value as a community, value the work that you do, um, and the outcome that that will have for your, for the, for the families that you serve? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for asking. I would say we would definitely have my family, um, like I said, I work um, two part-time jobs. A lot of people have a running joke like, are you always working? And my daughters, um, they constantly get affected by me not being to have time to pick them. Like I'm always running late to pick them up from school. Um, and I'm not able to do like, she wants to do ballet. She wants to do other activities. I have to like scramble around at food banks to try to find food for my girls. And they miss being able to yeah. make for me to make that lunch. They miss me being able to do certain things that I did when I was, I had the money and the foods because I had food stamps. I was just recently homeless. I was just recently homeless and I just got an apartment and I have to constantly work. I don't sleep. I probably get like two hours to sleep. Um, and I also have like, to uh, take medication for anxiety and depression due to me not being able to sleep. And it's a, it's a mental stressful load. And having a raise would provide me the space and time to focus more on my daughters. Um, I'm grateful to be able to work from home, but them not being able to have their mom when they come home from school, they already have a rough day at school. Like they already have to deal with Okay. shooters, active shooter, active shooter drills, um, their teachers being stressed out about yeah. um, being in the classroom. And I can't do that because I, I make 42K before taxes. So really I bring home like 3,600. Like I, I will be able to save to be able to buy a home for my girls. So we don't have to keep paying rent. We could, I can buy a home where they can have a backyard. Right. Like I don't have to my car got repoed twice because I couldn't afford to pay my car note. I had to wait three, four months to pay my car note. Like my daughters need that mom. Like they, mm -hmm. they I'm trying not to get emotional again, but they, they need me. No, and I shouldn't be able to decide. 
Yeah. Yeah, you shouldn't have to decide. And and the fact that you make the choice you to do this work, to give of yourself, to support other families. Um, and all you're asking for is a living wage and the ability to be able to support your family, support your girls, grow uh, your own family's generational wealth. And, you know, um, and then in the midst of that, you do have to deal with anxiety and stress and all those things. And, and, and I do too. And I, I want you, I want to know that I, I hear you. And I think this is an example of, so, and I appreciate your vulnerability and I appreciate your candidness because I think the issue in, in, in our our world today is that policymakers so often don't understand the stories of the individuals who are really on the ground doing the work. And they can't even, some people don't even have the ability to fathom all that you have to balance, all that you have to go through and all the weight of the world that is on your shoulders. And because they may come from a different place of privilege and position in society, they really just are so out of touch with what that even would feel like. And, and many could never even survive all that you have survived and overcome all that you've overcome and still be able to stay, come to a hearing and give that story amidst what you're doing. Um, so I, I want to say, I appreciate your testimony. I'm going to do my part as everything that I can and my will as a policymaker, but I just want you to know that I, I appreciate the work you've given. And I think oftentimes as Black women, we take on all the burdens of all the things um, and that's naturally just who we are. Um, but we also have to take the time to care for ourselves and, and have self-care. And self-care is a privilege, though. When people tell us to just do it, we're like, yeah, that's great. It's one thing to say do it, but it's another thing to have the ability, the, the funds, the time, the space, the energy to be able to do that work. So um, I just wanted to say that to you. I appreciate it. And I'll do all I can in my part. Thank you for your honesty, your vulnerability, for the work you do every day in supporting um, uh, the families that you support, um, and, and congrats, and, and I'm, and I'm proud of all that you're doing right now and all that is going to come in the future for you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, council member. You're welcome. Sure. Right. Sorry. We're going to move on. <laughs> you're going to move, we're going to move on to the next panel. Um, our next panel is, we have Dion Bussey reader uh, the Chief Executive Officer, the Far Southeast Family Strengthening Collaborative, uh, Sherry Kraft, the CEO of Smart from the Start, Inc., uh, Kaylin Keller, uh, DC Kin Care Alliance, Melody Webb, Executive Director for Mothers Outreach, uh, Tiffany Blakeney, Legal and Advocacy Fellow for Mothers Outreach Network and NDC Guaranteed Income Coalition, and Maria Jackson, Jackson Legal and Advocacy Fellow, Mothers Outreach Network for DC Guaranteed Income Coalition. As uh, and I will while I have this moment, that last panel, I forgot to do my reminder to upload your testimony. So please don't forget if you have not uploaded your testimony, please do. You have till April 19th um, uh, to, to upload your testimony and send it to facilities at dccouncil.gov. Um, I'll do another reminder at the end here while we're waiting for this first panel to come in. Um, Leon, if Bussy Reader, if you're here, can you um, just raise your hand so we can um, uh, make sure your panelists get first up? Uh, Ms. Sherry, we're going to start with you while we wait to see if we can get um, Dion on here. Uh, Sherry Kraft is founder, CEO of Smart from the Start, Inc. Good afternoon, um, and thank you for being here to give testimony. Good afternoon, Madam Chairperson and members of the committee. Thank you for affording me an opportunity to address the hearing as a representative of the Family's First DC Success Network of Organizations serving communities in Ward 5, 7, and 8. 
Uh, I'm the founder and chief executive officer of Smart from the Start, and I'm also proud to lead the Woodland Terrace and Carter Langston uh, Family Success Centers. Smart is a comprehensive family support and community engagement organization that has as our mission to promote the physical, developmental, and emotional health and wellness of young children, youth, and families living in underserved communities. Our family and community-driven programs and services provide the tools, resources, and support that they need in times of crisis, as well as to break cycles of generational poverty and ensure that our families thrive. The multi-generational evidence-based program empowers families by identifying and building on their strengths uh, and protective factors while employing a strength-based approach to mitigating the effects of trauma and addressing social determinants of health. I'm here to speak on behalf of the entire network of family success centers this afternoon, first in expressing our deepest gratitude uh, to you all on the council uh, and in the administration for your ongoing support. Our success centers funded by CFSA in wards five, seven, and eight offer unprecedented access to well-resourced neighborhood-based holistic programs and services that are uniquely effective in meeting the very immediate needs of thousands and children of children and families in our wards, but also providing opportunity for educational growth, economic advancement, civic empowerment, and optimal health and wellness. The deliberate effort to nurture relationships among grantee organizations has been successful in weaving a tighter safety net for our families across the wards while encouraging collaboration, shared resources, joint problem solving. We've collectively served literally thousands of children and families in coordinated programs and services that are preventative in nature, while also providing supports to intervene and assist families in difficult times or when crises arrive. The programs we offer include trauma-informed early uh, childhood programs. We offer parenting, on-site physical and mental health and wellness programming, health and nutrition classes, adult and parenting education, uh, educational arrangement, support for children, youth, uh, in civics and leadership as well. Um, opportunities for, for professional certifications like uh, CDLs, commercial uh, driver's license, food handlers, and so on and so forth. Employment placement services, life skills, financial literacy, and self-sufficiency programming and more. While proven to reduce the number of children in care and increase the well-being of children and families, this concept of child welfare investing in upstream preventable services is still new and it's not widely embraced. Child welfare agencies are still largely seen as foster care and child protective agencies. The innovative and significant multi-million dollar investment that Mayor Bowser has made and this council stands behind is a national evidence-based model for the prevention of family separation, child maltreatment, and the promotion of physical, mental, developmental, and financial health within our families and communities. The return on investment as a result of the dramatic reduction of children in care or in the juvenile justice systems, remedial education services, health disparities, self-medication, and other preventable and costly challenges prove this to be a wise use of public funds. For example, the recidivism rate among young fathers in our trauma-informed professional development and enrichment program has dropped below 8%, according to independent evaluation out of Tufts University. I wanna emphasize that this highly successful initiative, although it's very young, is unique due to the freedom it has allowed us to innovate and customize programming in close partnership with the families and residents we serve, while also collaborating with the large network of agency partners, including many that uh, have testified today like Mary Center. While SMART was founded as a family and community driven organization, often funding of this magnitude comes with a rigid set of guidelines that explicitly determine who recipients of service must be, what services must be provided, when, how and by whom, instead of putting that, those decisions in the hands of the communities. I personally have been invited to share the Families First DC story on webinars, podcasts, at conferences nationwide, as other cities and municipalities look to Washington DC and CFSA for guidance and best practice to launch or improve preventative programs and services. Our success centers now, just in year three of active programming, have continued to increase our staffing capacity by hiring not only DC residents, but many of those we previously supported in our programs. 
Several months ago, in response to the uptick in violence, depression, self-medication as a result of ongoing trauma amongst our youth, our Woodland Terrace Family Success Center in partnership with DCHA opened our first Youth Empowerment and Success Center in Woodland Terrace. Six members of our staff are graduates of our Young Parents Program, including four young fathers. Children ages eight to 17 years old now have a safe place of their own in their community where they're provided hot, nutritious dinner six nights a week. They have the support of trained therapeutic mentors. They can engage in homework help, counseling, physical fitness, Toastmasters, STEAM educational programs, and more. And they have the added benefit of being supported by young parents with lived experience from their very own neighborhoods. This is just one example of how CFSA's Family Success Centers innovate and create interventions and support specifically based on the needs of the children and families we support, fight for, and uplift in our community. The ongoing extensive training TA uh, and technical assistance that Octavia Shaw and her team have provided us ensures the efficacy and high quality of our programming. The multiple opportunities provided for the Success Center Network to collaborate, partner, share resources and best practices with one another have led to seamless service delivery across communities and the coordination of the Families First data collection system tracks our progress, evaluates our outcomes and ensures continuous quality improvement. In closing, on behalf of children, families in Ward 5, 7, and 8, along with my Success Center partners, I want to thank the Council, Mayor Bowser, Director Matthews, Octavia Shaw, and the team uh, for the, the, the long-lasting impact on the lives of those we engage, we support, we equip, and empower by this project cannot be overstated, and the ongoing investment in the powerful, resilient, and gifted population of families who benefit will lead to safer children, stronger families, and a more vibrant Washington, D.C. I'm happy to answer any questions about our organization or our network. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your testimony. If you could stay on, because I have some questions sure. at the end of this panel. Um, next up, we have Kaylin Keller, DC Kin Care Alliance. Good afternoon, Kaylin. Good afternoon, Chairperson Lewis George and members of the Committee on Facilities and Family Services. My name is Kaylin Keller, and I am a staff attorney with the DC Kin Care Alliance. Our mission is to support the legal, financial, and related service needs of relative caregivers who step up to raise children and their extended families in times of crisis when the children's parents are not able to care for them. Approximately 22,000 Black and Brown DC children are living in kinship care arrangements, representing about 20% of all DC children of color. In the five years since our founding, we have helped over 600 relative caregivers raising more than 700 DC children and over 700 legal matters. DC Kin Care Alliance is a member of the Fair Budget Coalition, and we support budget priorities and policies that alleviate poverty in the District of Columbia. I am pleased to testify today regarding our proposals to amend the Grandparent Caregiver Program and Close Relative Caregiver Program to ensure their purposes are fully achieved. Specifically, we ask the Council to consider a change to the eligibility limits as well as the subsidy amounts to address inflation and the escalating costs of raising a child in DC. With respect to the eligibility limits, we request that the council implement a stepped approach to eligibility such that a caregiver would not be terminated from just over the income limit. In this regard, we recommend that the household income cutoff be raised by 200% to 300% of the federal poverty level. We note that even at 300% of the FPL, a family in DC is still poor and has a difficult time making ends meet as the FPL does not account for different cost of living standards in different jurisdictions. It is important to note that even though informal kinship caregivers are caring for many children who would otherwise enter the foster care system, they are not entitled to the foster care subsidy, which does not have any income eligibility requirements. We further ask the council to amend the law to provide that when determining financial eligibility, SSI benefits should not be included in calculating the household's income. If a household member receives SSI, it is because that person needs that income to mitigate the financial impact of their disability and to provide for their basic maintenance. The council should not expect that income to be available to other household members for any other purpose and should not include that income for financial eligibility purposes for the caregiver subsidy. Correspondingly, we believe that a child with a disability who receives SSI benefits and whose relative caregiver 
is otherwise eligible for the GCP or the CRCP subsidy should not have the amount of their GCP or CRCP benefits produced because of the child's SSI benefits. As a society, we provide SSI benefits to children from low income households because we recognize that a child with a serious disability has greater needs and associated costs than a similarly situated child without a serious disability. As district residents, we provide the GCP and CRCP subsidies to relative caregivers from low income households because we recognize that suddenly taking in a traumatized child is expensive. When we deduct the amount of a child's SSI benefits from their GCP or CRCP benefits, we are telling a relative caregiver that we think they should magically be able to meet the increased needs and costs of caring for a child with a disability for the same amount of money that a child without disability receives. At CFSA's performance oversight hearing in February, you heard from two relative caregivers of children with disabilities who applied for the close relative caregiver program who were, who were approved, but their benefits were calculated to be zero because the amount of their CRCP benefits were entirely offset by the amount of the child's SSI benefits. It is worth noting that DC code section 4-251.24C did not always require that GCP and CRCP benefits be offset by a child's SSI benefits. There is nothing in the legislative history that reveals any justification for this harmful change. We need to rectify this inequity now. As DC relies more and more heavily on relatives to raise children outside of the foster care system, it should work to ensure the safety and stability of these kinship families. DC's relative caregivers are primarily women of color who live in wards seven and eight. Most live at the economic margins of our society, even before they are called upon to raise a relative child. Many report a significant disability themselves. The children who come into their care arrive with nothing but the clothes on their back and relative caregivers have to scramble to buy food, clothing, shoes, toiletries, bedding, and even sometimes a bed. Often they wind up following for, falling further into poverty with no money to pay for rent, food, heat, water, or electricity. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'll have some questions at the end of this panel. Um, next up, we have Melody Webb, Executive Director, Mothers Outreach Network. Good afternoon, Chairperson Lewis George. I'm Melody Webb, head of Mothers Outreach Network in the DC Guaranteed Income Coalition, and I'm a native Washingtonian and resident of Ward 6. I'm honored to appear with mom advocates uh, Tiffany Blakeney and Maria Jackson today. Uh, we're an advocacy and legal services organization that works for policies that keep marginalized families in DC together, including through engaging black moms in our work to transform government income and child welfare systems using legal community and policy advocacy. In addition, this month we will launch Mother Up, a philanthropy funded guaranteed income cash pilot for moms with child welfare system involvement. New research has found that family economic setbacks and lack of access to basic economic needs predict child welfare involvement. And the economic policies that soften financial shocks and hardship can reduce maltreatment and child protective involvement. In 2020, nearly nine out of 10 open cases at CFSA involved neglect. And in 2019, four out of every five DC cases in foster care stem from neglect-based allegations alone. Nearly 12% of open cases tend to involve families with housing insecurity. Neglect defined by statute includes harming the health or welfare of a child under 18 years of age and doing so through failing to accord them adequate food, clothing, shelter, education, or medical care. This is against a backdrop of poverty in DC. 16% of the total population lives below the poverty line, including 42% of single mothers. Poverty has consequences that include family destabilization and child welfare involvement. In terms of our budget recommendations, first, we appreciate the agency's efforts in making much needed changes to the Child Protection Register and hope they are retroactive and understand implementation will require a budget that we fully support, particularly given our legal work to help DC's parents with neglect findings to rebuild their lives in the aftermath of the case closure. In line with our support for Right to Counsel, which we're studying, we believe funding for a Right to Counsel program or study of a Right to Counsel program should be provided. The laudable register changes are an important step, but there's more to do. The COVID-19 pandemic re reinvigorated a war on poverty, deploying a simple weapon, cash. Cash is guaranteed income, the ultimate upstream solution. The agency should join in. Guaranteed income is regular payments paid to individuals, usually below 
the poverty line with no strings attached and no work requirement. Strong Families, Strong Futures, which we fought for, is one such example. I'm here today to press the need for the agency's leadership to deploy dollars as prevention and mitigation measures, dollars in the hands of parents. Again, the bulk of the agency's cases are neglect-based and we posit poverty-driven. We support guaranteed income as a measure to address this. However, we urge the agency to tackle what would seem simplest, to spend down all of its flex fund budget in the most permissive way possible is cash and to provide cash to biological parents with no strings attached and no work requirements from the flex fund as a child benefit for in-home services and reunification purposes. The agency should use all of its allocated funds, leave, don't leave any unused and use all of its housing voucher and rapid housing programs for families. We support the use of agency funds toward the, the legislation, the district child tax credit and financial support for families with children as well. Um, in terms of agency flex funds, we have questions. What percentage of dollars is actually spent on families for furniture or rental arrears? It is not clear what goes to actual families versus foster resources and what latitude the agency has pursuant to law rules or other policy. We're seeking clarity because it appears the agency is failing to provide the flex fund numbers in detail, although I've heard the agency mention that they do, but we can't discern a breakdown of in-home versus foster care amount. We saw only one amount as a result in these line items, and it appears to combine both types of spending. If the answer is there, please make it plainer. Um, as referenced in our written testimony, for example, it appears that $137,000 went unspent on child care or other services in FY 2022 of the approved $687,000 budget. Um, additionally, in fiscal year 2022, $24,000 of the, the food budget went unspent, food voucher budget, and a quarter of children in DC goes hungry. Um, and surely this is the case for in-home uh, cases as well. 58,000 in the child care clothing category also went unspent. And again, it's not clear to us which percentage is spent on families, biological families and which versus foster families. In addition, um, we wanna just point out with the HUD Family Unification Program, we wanna know how many clients and constituents um, are approaching the agency and not getting offered these services. We have clients and constituents who could absolutely use them. Um, a pattern, a similar pattern of underuse of resources is, in the, is seen in this area. At the start of fiscal year 2022, there was an allocation of 36 housing choice vouchers remaining under the Family Unification Program, and my colleagues will testify about this as well. And in FY23, the agency has allocated only one FUP voucher to DC parents with children in foster care to support reunification. I'll also just briefly mention in the Rapid Housing Program Fund, if you look at the numbers of who applied, who received, and the number of children affected, it looks like in fiscal year 2021, three families applied and zero families actually uh, received uh, those um, in FY 2022. For some reason, zero families applied in the reunification program where rapid housing is concerned. Again, 14 families applied and laudably 12 of them did receive help. However, in fiscal year 2022, four applied and only half of those families received uh, the services. So Washington DC is really on the cusp of revolutionary guaranteed income and cash assistance programs for all. And the agency should help move DC in this direction by deploying all of its allocated resources for families in the flex fund. And with proper investment and upstream investment, as we've heard mention of today, and a larger and broader guaranteed income program across the city, uh, we can in fact reach uh, that destination. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, stay on, we have some questions at the end of this panel. Um, next up, we have uh, Tiffany Blakeney. Chairperson, she's saying she's having trouble rejoining. Okay, we'll try to get Tiffany um, back on. I'll work with my staff to do that. Uh, is Maria 
Jackson, are you here? I think she's also trying to join. They were originally uh, in the meeting as attendees and may not okay. have been able to join as- They're gonna, we're, okay, there you go, I see, great. Uh, just click when they're- How you doing? Good. Uh, my name, good afternoon. Gotcha. My name is Maria Jackson. I'm testifying with my, this is our reach network. I just moved to Ward 2. Before I lived in Ward 7, I was born and raised in Washington, D.C. I'm a mother of four. I dealt with child protective services, SDFSA for 12, for three years. I'm here to speak on behalf of the people who can speak for themselves. I'm concerned of CMSA spending its budget on festival year 2000. Our research found that CFSA spent the following. They have spent $104,000 and spent their clothes, children clothes. They spent about $8,000 or so. So there was just 58,000 left in the budget. That that not that was that was not spent on the children. My concern was because my concern was to know where the money where the money went. And was the children took care of that was in the group home and to make sure they get a good wardrobe. They are they are. They had 40, 48 vouchers. They only gave out five vouchers. They also had used thirty six of their vouchers. No, that's wrong. They only used five of their vouchers of housing. Still, if they really wanted, if still they really wanted to get help the children not get taken away. They would have used the vouchers to support the family in need. The second concern that I have is, is access to lawyers. And when the family is to be given a lawyer, as soon as the case is open with CFSA, they have no idea what's going on. They do not know their rights. If the family is giving the lawyer, it can make sure that they are making the right decision about remove about removing their child and think in the the next year. And I'm sorry about this. The next year budget is jumped all around. I apologize about this. The next year, I think the next year budget should provide enough money for the families to get lawyers and to help them make the right decision and to understand what they are going to get this up into. And finally, I would like to know about CFSA and what, is the, what are they going to prevent all the accusations. The accusations that have the social workers waste time, and the people that are accused of whatever, whatever is going on now, how whatever is going on, is accused. CFS, they should do something about the people that make the false accusations. And um, Chairwoman Lewis George, that's how I feel. I went through a lot of that myself, but that's what I'm writing at. I have a child myself that's in dealing with that. And I would like to know what are they doing? They have that much money left over. And he's in group home. I would like to know, is he getting his money to get a new job? Is he being taken care of? And when they were with me over there where I did that, I had bad problems in that house. So I'm just making sure that they should be giving out more vouchers to help the family, not, take, not break up the families, 
to reunite the families. Chairman, that's all. I, before I put the Lord, I was breaking the families, not reuniting. Me being a mother before, and now I have three. I know. Thank you for having me speak to you, man. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your testimony. Um, I really appreciate uh, your 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 candidness and um, uh, sharing sharing your story and, and how decisions have impacted you all as well. I may have some questions um, at the end of this panel. Uh, Tiffany, if you're trying to get on, just we're going to be trying to get you on as a panelist. Um, if you when you get something, okay. Something should pop up and you can push yes to being a panelist. I think she's gonna try to join by phone now. Thank you. Oh, I see, I see her, yep. Okay, yeah, thank you, sorry thank about you. that. No problem, thank you. Good afternoon, oh, I'm sorry. Oh no, I was just saying thank you for joining. <laughs> yes, thanks for having me and allowing me to speak. Good afternoon, my name is Tiffany Blakeney. I have two children. My oldest is 17 and my youngest is seven. The first concern I would like to talk about today is how CFSA spent their budget for fiscal year 22. In fiscal year 22, we found that CFSA had a lot of money allotted for helping families, which they did not spend. For example, they had 40 housing vouchers that could have they could have given the families, but in fiscal year 22, they only gave away four of those housing vouchers. So there were 36 that they did not use. They allocated 145,000 for emergency funds, but they only spent 63,000. So there was almost about 82,000, which they had, but did not spend. They also allocated 142,000 for childcare and clothing, but they only spent 84,000. So there was almost about 58,000 that had that they had, but they did not spend. The last time I testified in front of this committee for CFSA's performance oversight hearing, I talked about how I did not think CFSA provided enough mental health resources for families, especially for children who aged out of foster care. I asked about what programs exist for children once they are too old to be in CFSA custody for their mental health. I wanna know are you considering using some of the budget money for, to fund those kinds of programs? Since there's clearly more, there's clearly money left in CFSA's budget that they are not spending. They could use that money to fund the mental health resources I'm talking about. Also, maybe some of the leftover money could be used to fund, college, to fund college scholarships for children once they age out of CFSA custody. If we really want to help these children, we can't just help them when they're young. We have to help them even as they age out of the system in order to help them be successful, I feel. Lastly, I wanna share my own experience. The first time I reached out to Child and Family Services Agency was when my son was in the fifth grade because I felt that he needed some help at school. He was having problems, um, current meetings, everything. I felt like I needed, he needed mentorship resources. And since I was a single mother raising a young man, I was looking for help to provide that mentorship. I went to Child and Family Services to see if they could help me provide mentorship resources, which explained, when, when I explained the situation, after waiting in the lobby for about 30 minutes, Someone came to speak to me and she explained that they couldn't help me because my child didn't have a case. So maybe some of the extra money can be used to help other children and families that are not in the system, but may need some help from child and family sources, from child and family services agencies. I want to thank you for your time and hopefully we can talk about some of these things soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, next up, we have uh, Dion Busi-Reader. 
Chief Executive Officer for Southeast Family Strengthening Collaborative. Thank you so very much. I appreciate you, uh, Chairwoman Lewis George. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity to testify before you. My sincere apologies for being late, I had another commitment. So I'm in my car, wanted to make sure I got this done because it's imperative for the work that we do. Again, uh, good afternoon, Chairwoman Lewis George and members of the committee. I am Dion Bussey Reader and I serve as the Chief Executive Officer for the Far Southeast Family Strengthening Collaborative. As you know, the Far Southeast Family Strengthening Collaborative is one of five collaboratives. My sister organizations are the uh, Collaborative Solutions for Communities, Georgia Avenue Family Support Collaborative, Edgewood Brooklyn Family Support Collaborative, and East River Strengthening Collaborative. For over 30 years, um, as you're aware, this collective has dedicated to ensuring children's safety, permanency, and well being, which is the ultimate goal of child welfare work. Through this collaboration, providing community centered support, promoting safety, and providing the rights of children and families always as a primary objective, we do preventive care. In my testimony today, I want to raise an alarm about the financial impact the strained CFSA budget will have on community based organizations providing essential life-saving service. And that's what's so key for this conversation. This testimony will focus on two critical areas impacted by scaled down CFSA budgets. First, is the strain budget negatively impacts our ability to respond comprehensively to the needs of families in crisis. Second is one of the greatest challenges, recruiting and retaining skilled staff. Across the district and especially in the southeastern parts of this ward, of the city, excuse me, Ward 7 and 8, the collaboratives have seen an increase in the number of families seeking supportive services with even a more critical need regarding the severity of the challenges they are experiencing. As the first slide of defense, we see the very first hand of the strained resources across the hospitals, the courts, and the prison system. The child welfare system is no different. The complexities of the cases and the crisis we see requires a well-staffed team with skilled individuals to further reduce and prevent harm. The collaborative movement is an effective prevention modeling, highlighting the value of infusing resources to strengthen families within the community and building the community's capacity to solve its own problems that will actually drive the well-being of children and families. We are impacted negatively. Many of our staff are trained in our organizations, receive the skill sets necessary, and like any other young person or person that comes to for employment, they want better opportunities. So when we're in competition with the District of Columbia to hire and maintain skilled staff to do the grassroots level work to prevent families from coming to the system, we're not equipped financially to pay what the city's able to pay. And then on top of that, we're affected because our budgets are cut substantially. And then we're told it is mandated that you have to have people in these positions or we won't fund the positions. So you all know firsthand the troubles and the struggles that the District of Columbia government is having with hiring skilled staff. But yet and still, when you see our very skilled staff employees come to one meeting, many of them are offered jobs in this District of Columbia government. And who wouldn't take a job when you're looking at us being able to pay you between 55 and 60,000 to be a family support worker and the District of Columbia can pay you upwards 70 to 80. Not only is this a deficit for us, it impacts our ability to serve the families that are in greatest need. And then we struggle with the fact that our budgets will be cut to do more, but with less resources. In closing, I want the District of Columbia to know as they are working to keep DC families together, not to forget that thousands of our residents in DC, community-based organizations like the collaborators are an extension of their families and we need resources to support them, not cutting resources with greater responsibility to do the work. Thank you so very much for this opportunity to speak before you. Thank you so much uh, for your testimony. Um, and for the work of the, the collaborative uh, and, and its benefit to our, our district uh, residents. Um, I wanna start with uh, questions for this panel. Um, Ms. Kraft, thank you for testifying and for all your hard work. 
um, as well. Can you talk more about how the success centers are funded? Uh, since there are numerous success centers, I would imagine that each center has different needs. And I just want to understand how you all are seeing how the funding is coming to you. Oh, absolutely. So each of us, when the uh, success centers were first uh, funded, we were funded at about 400. I believe Dion's on here. She's one of the recipients. Yeah, I'm going to ask her the same question. Dion, yes, we were funded at $400,000 per year. Those Our budgets were almost immediately cut to $325,000 a year. We each received that level of funding, but we are able to uh, customize how the funding is used to meet the needs. What we do at SMART, and I think the, the other uh, organizations can speak to this, but they do some, some semblances of a community needs assessment. We do it annually. We ask the folks of Woodland Terrace and Langston um, and Carver what it is uh, that they would prioritize and how they want us to use those funds. Um, and that's how we allocate the funds um, that we are given. In addition to those funds, we are all out there writing grants and trying to secure dollars from other um, avenues in order to build capacity around that base funding that we receive. Oops. Sorry, I'm, I'm muted. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, that was me. Uh, Dion, I wanted to come to you as well and understanding sort of um, the funding mechanism for how you all are funded. Where, where and and um, sort of where, what would be adequate funding for you all and, and how does that come through to you um, through through CFSA? So we're, uh, we actually received three grants from the Child and Family Services Administration. One is the base grant that has done most of our work, which is the Child Welfare Grant. And we likewise, um, like my sister agency, um, Cherie, we actually have one of the family success centers. We started off with a much larger budget. And not only have we, re they have, we reduced the budget by over $75,000, but more importantly, the required services are still the same. So with less money, we are still required to do as much as we were with more money in this budget. And that is seemingly really difficult. And again, it's difficult to maintain qualified, trained staff to do the work effectively. So yes, our budget was cut by the same amount of money. We started off with 450,000. Yeah. Now we're at 325. Okay. With no, we were told specifically that there will not be an increase in those dollars. Okay, and what do you mean when you say required? Um, the required grant order. agreements, the required, the required the, uh, service deliveries that we're oh. required to actually meet the outcomes for the grant. They're still the same. So you're not oh, doing less work. You see what I'm saying? Okay. You got le yeah. less money. Yep. But say yep. the same expectation. Okay. Got it. Boom. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, yeah. Okay. That, that makes sense. And, and that's an issue because yeah, the, the, the math, that doesn't add up as far as how. <laughs> not not at all. Logic, logic and practical goes that that doesn't that doesn't add up at all. Okay, yeah. thank you. I pre I appreciate that. Um, let me let me see what work we can we can do within this budget. Um, and and not for us, if you don't mind, um, Chairman. Um, it's not just the the uh, family success centers model, which is really coined after the collaborative model all across the board. Um, but the child welfare work, which is the most instrumental work that we do on a prevention arm, to cut those dollars and require us to do new services is problematic. And it is going to be problematic retaining the staff to do the work. That's right. That's the other, that's the other, the other thing about it is going to, retaining staff to do that is also, you, you're, you're almost creating that issue and it's going to come inevitably. I mean, it, it's not, this isn't easy work. It's hard work. It's, it's, um, it's not for, for the faint of heart and people have to be compensated for that and also have to have realistic caseloads and realistic workloads um, to be able to be effective. Uh, thank, I appreciate that. Carolyn Keller, I want to come to you. Um, thank you for your testimony. My staff is looking into making those necessary changes to the SSI eligibility limits. Could you talk more about or give a little more guidance on raising the federal poverty level from 200% to 300%? versus removing SSI considerations altogether when doing a calculation? Yeah, um, we think that both of those uh, um, would be necessary changes because a lot of the times what we see with um, our caregivers is they qualify for the CRCP or the GCP um, 
and then they go and get a job or they get a better paying job yeah. and it only barely puts them over. Um, so they would actually be making less than, um, cause they'll lose the subsidy. Um, okay. and we don't think oh, that's yeah. fair because if our caregivers are going out to get jobs and better their, themselves and, um, that sort of thing. And I think the SSI payments, um, I think the issues go hand in hand, but I also, um, think that both changes are necessary. Okay. All right. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, Melody, and our, I just want you to know, our team is looking at this closely and trying to fix it. Um, this is something we, we, we were just talking about yesterday, actually, um, in our, in our staff meeting. Um, so we're going to try to right size this uh, as much as possible. So I appreciate, uh, your testimony as well as uh, suggestions there. Um, Melody, I wanted to come to you. Can you talk more about how flex funds are used or, I mean, or we can go, I know you were saying we gotta go look and dig deeper there, but just, can you walk me through about uh, the process and what someone needs to do in order to have access to flex funds? Uh, Cheryl, well, we, we do not know. Right, <laughs> we yeah, would I guess. love to know <laughs> because we have constituents and clients who would love to access those. And I can just say anecdotally, maybe my colleagues here on the call can speak to it without revealing too much as, you know, an attorney working with them. But just it, we, we do know from others who aren't present that uh, families have ap approached the agency mm -hmm. and have requested resources. Um, and they've been told, you know, maybe it was a particular worker on a given day, and we know they have hard work to do, but they were told that the, the resources weren't available. Um, again, I have constituents who've talked about requesting support to buy, you know, beds for their children to sleep in, um, and, and the resources just aren't there. And I, I have heard the agency testify in the past, and I'm not really sure if this is a training issue or if it's, you know, just people aren't aware, but mm -hmm. I do know of parents who request assistance. And as was stated earlier, there is a fear in approaching the agency, just, you know, independently approaching the agency that there might be some repercussions and opening oneself up to unnecessary surveillance. But we would love to become privy to how families for prevention purposes can access yeah. the resources because we would spread the word. We would love to do that. Okay. Um, and Tiffany and Maria, what, have you all had any experience with, with flex, flex spending? What, what, has, what does that look like for you with, the, with being able to try to access that? I um, never heard of the flex uh, funding until like we started researching the budget. So mm -hmm. it was never offered to me or, you know, yeah. how to apply or what to do to get yeah. it, to use it. I'm, I never heard about it until I started researching the budget. Okay. I've never heard of it myself, neither. Okay. When I requested for help, it was used against me. Hmm. Got you. Okay. I'll also say, Chair, Chairwoman, that I served as an attorney for eight years um, and represented parents whose children had been removed from them, their care. And we would often scratch our heads as advocates for these parents as to how to locate housing vouchers. I was never made privy. I was always sent to the mayor's liaison's office in the Carl Moultrie Building Superior mm -hmm. Court. But it really was only when I started doing this work as an advocate on policy that I learned about these vouchers. It's possible I missed a training somewhere, but um, but I, you know, I again, we would love to make those resources known to others and would love to learn more about how those decisions are made and how people get invited to apply or not. Okay. Okay, I, I, I will do some follow up there and figure and try to get on the record tomorrow what the requirements are, what, you know, how, how do we access them and, and what, um, you know, what's necessary for, for community members to, to access those and sort of how that's determined. I'll try to uh, get that on record tomorrow um, with uh, CFSA. Um, so thank you for your testimony. Um, thank you to this entire panel. We are now gonna move to our final panel for this afternoon. Um, we have Travis Bailey, public witness, uh, Tamara Brooks, Community Family Life Services, and if it's Tamara, just let me know, sorry, uh, and uh, Pastor John Davis.
And I don't see uh, Travis here. Um, so uh, Ms. Brooks, you are first up and good afternoon. And thank you for being here um, uh, to testify. Good afternoon, I just wanted to take my mute off. I'm sorry, I'm bringing my screen at the same token. So please, I apologize if I'm looking down. I thought my camera was on. All right, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you everybody for being on the call for everybody's patience. I have I have enjoyed everyone's testimony. I love the passion that is displayed in everything that we do. Also, thank you council member for your patience as well. Your attentiveness to everyone's testimony is admirable. Um, I just have enjoyed, this is my second time speaking, and I have enjoyed your presence and just your patience and your sincerity in everybody's statement. And I do appreciate it in advance. Um, I wanted to start off by saying that I am tomorrow, it's tomorrow, and I don't, I don't correct people because it can be pronounced so many different ways. I am Tamara Brooks. I am the program manager and parent educator at Community Family Life Services. And I am speaking on behalf of home visitation for the increase that we're asking for home visitation as well with home visitation council with Nisa and Fernandez as well. I wanna to come to you all today to address you on behalf of women, specifically women because CFLS deals with women reentry as well as families of domestic violence, families and women of domestic violence. I appreciate and consider the opportunity to speak with you today. CFLS has provided mostly women with the tools and resources to help them move beyond poverty and homelessness in the district for more than 50 years. Our commitment to reentry has allowed us, it has allowed and provided, a, it has allowed us to provide safe housing and wraparound supportive services to aid women to move forward towards, a, towards permanent self-sufficiency. Funded through CFLS, funded through CFSA since 2013, we have provided group and individual parenting sessions with home visitation services to hundreds of families in the District of Columbia under our community, under the community-based child abuse prevention, CBCAP. Also, we have we have been able to reach women through the DC Correctional Facility, Fair, Fairview Halfway House, as well as C Sosa and many other community partnerships such as Sasha Bruce, My Sister's Place, and House of Rue. Home visitation allows caregivers to impact families significantly. Studies have shown that home visitation benefits and helps to increase family knowledge and involvement of milestones in development. It helps detect possible health concerns as well as developmental delays. It helps prevent the reoccurrence of child abuse and neglect. It also helps to identify learning disabilities early. Referral, it also refers families and programs to services through relationship with our community partnerships. As well, home visitation provides a unique service that is valuable to the comprehensive approach to combat barriers and connect families to resources. Pay increase can ensure home visitation programs remain stable. This can only come with the increase that we ask today. I wanna say that I did hear on a first testimony that someone, I did look up to see that in 2000, you have not, we have not, home visitation has not had an increase since 2019, which I did research what is the average pay of home visitors in 2019. And it stated that it was 27,000 to $41,000 as a salary for someone living in DC. And me being a Washingtonian myself who grew up in Southeast DC off of Goho Road, I am an alumni of Anacostia High School. I cannot imagine a parent having to make a salary as low entry level as a home visitor for something that they may want to go in their community and be able to go into these houses in their community only making $27,000 a year. That's a little bit above getting public service and welfare. And I say welfare because I'll show my age. And that's the, but and now looking, then I had to also Google what is now the average home visitation? salary and as an average starting is 34. I did hear someone else mention in their testimony that it was 41. So I looked up 34 at the lowest to see. That means that every pay period that parent that that home visitation worker will bring home thirteen hundred dollars a pay period. For us to ask for three hundred thousand dollars is the smallest is the small is a minimum to just please part us with something is so hurtful in some ways when you listen to it. Also thinking back, and I'm very reflective, so thinking back reflectively to the budget hearing as the mayor went through the budget, and I heard Felix say, the pickleball, 
pickleball or the recreation funding that is given to the District of Columbia that does not give to home aides who go inside these houses, go inside these neighborhoods to go into these houses put their life and their health at risk, are not being able to be able to sustain their families. I heard the young lady speak as to her being a foster mother who was making, I think she said $3,600 a pay period or $3,600 a month. Imagine the, the gap in between that space. $300,000 is a small ask, a very minuscule ask, like, I mean, I mean, like miniature on top of everything else. But we do ask for that increase because that will put us at least somewhere ahead and not behind. That's a four year deficit, which the district, we owe that to the District of Columbia. And this is not for brown skin families. This is for everyone who may need help. And that is for CFSA, foster care, or incarcerated women as well reunifying this coming back out. We do ask for your help in this council member. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. And I have some questions at the end of this panel, which I think is a short panel. Let me say this now, if there's anyone who wanted to testify, who has not, did not have the opportunity, did not sign up, but you are here, can you raise your hand and let us know? Cause this is our final panel. Um, and so I just wanna make sure we see you. Um, and now I am going to go to Pastor John Davis. Good afternoon, Council Person, uh, Ms. George. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here today. Um, I would also like to say hi to the Committee on Facilities and Family Services and Committee staff. As you stated, I am Pastor John Davis from Keep It Moving Empowerment Ministries. I also do a lot of work with Dr. Bruce with the Love More Movement as a life coach. And lately have been doing a lot of work with the Director of Child and Family Services. Um, it is such an honor for me, really it is. I'm, I'm what they call a lived experience person. Uh, really I volunteer most of the work I do. I do a lot of outreach period trying to help some of the harm that I was a part of early on. So it's, a, it's an honor for me to sit at the table and be a part of what looks like a solution for what's going on. While sitting here just now, my phone is going off, all these shootings going on in the district. Um, right. So let me stick to the script though, but that, that moves me because I know everything somehow is interconnected. So yeah. I am so grateful to have this opportunity. Um, the time that I spend working with Director Matthews, um, it's time that I, I really get a lot out of it. Um, I have been being showed a, a lot of stuff that I know can make a difference in our communities. Um, I'm on an advisory count, I'm one of the advisory council members, um, and I love working with the community leaders. And, and I work with people from all eight wards throughout the district. I'm constantly out in, in all the different neighborhoods doing work. My dog is getting on my nerve, but I'm gonna put him out. Um, <laughs> it's important for me. He knows when I'm doing stuff, so he wants to go outside. But anyway. I know, I, you know, I have, I have a puppy. I, you know, my, my puppy, Sally, is the same way. Don't worry. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can't let my wife know that I said that, though. But um, <laughs> I'm going to share this clip with her when I see her. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but I, um, I'm a co, what I, what I am is the lived experience advisory council, co-lead of the warm line community response subcommittee with child and family services agency, um, keeping DC families together. So as I stated, the time that I spend with the director, with the staff members, with the advisory council members, community leaders, and the people from all different wards throughout the district. It leads me to understand and to accept with 100% certainty that the warm line is not only a necessity, but it will brighten the outcomes of many of the struggling families and children. The many hours that I spent working on this effort are counted with joy um, on my end, I would do it for free over and over again, because I know the harm that's been done when we lessen the, uh, the alternatives for families that already come to their plight 
with very limited opportunities. Uh, I'm one of those people who grew up in Southeast um, and I know what it can be like and people be saying, well, it don't have to be like that. If you walk in those shoes, it's like that. The warm line will focus on prevention and be dedicated to finding alternatives to breaking up the family structure, searching for better solutions to keeping families together and working with families to overcome their struggles rather than punishing them for struggling. It's nothing worse than me anyway, knowing that a person won't be honest because they know if they be honest, they're going to get penalized. And really all they need is help. The hotline works fine, but oftentimes the end result of, of the help that should be provided to those in need is separation of families. And in most cases, that is not the best solution. The warm line would be another alternative to the CPS hotline. It will not replace it. In order to uh, fully implement keeping DC families together, the district needs to have the infrastructure and the resources to support a warm line and community support model that involves financial support and partnerships from all the other DC um, government sister agencies, community-based organizations, community members who are members of our Keeping DC Families Together Citywide Steering Committee. I thank you for your time and anything that I can do to help or any questions that you have, I'm always free and I thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Davis. Um, uh, let me first just respond um, to Tamara. One, thank you for the work you do and thank you for the conversation, you know, bringing attention to, uh, you know, what's very real and sort of, you know, in conversations about where funding is going, who who's getting it, who's being listened to, who's being prioritized. And, you know, again, I, I think I, I think there really truly must be a disconnect. And I really feel this way with like, <laughs> with like the real life lived experiences of people every day right now and how hard it is to just survive on basic necessities just to be able to pay your rent or pay your mortgage or pay mm -hmm. and pay for food. And that don't even factor in transportation or medical bills or doctor visits, okay. visits or I mean, it didn't factor in. We're just talking about basic needs, just meeting the need, people's basic needs, just basic needs. Uh, and especially in a city like D.C. where, you you know, the average one bedroom is up now twenty three hundred dollars, twenty two hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. So if somebody's only getting paid thirteen hundred, then what do, what what do they have left to to live to be able to provide for their family just for themselves? And if you have children on top of that, it's just like, you know, what we what are we doing? We're just setting we're setting up ourselves to to fail. And then, you know, like Mr. Davis is saying, you know, crime, you know, everyone talk about it, safety's out of control, crime is out of control. We have a sort of deteriorating society and community. People are need basic needs aren't met. And they're just, I mean, it's it's out of control. And and it's all like Mr. Pastor Davis said, interconnected. You right. can't, you can't even you can't run from it. You right. can't run for from how connected and interconnected this is um and how important this this work is uh in in the work we do and it all sort of it all sort of transpires and we don't have home health you know home aids helping and supporting families whether it's expecting mothers new mothers expecting fathers you know new fathers um you know whether it's even we have home health aids in a health context our seniors like if we don't have these people the people in place and we don't value their positions and the work that they do then we're just setting ourselves up for failure and then looking around like things are crazy what's happening what's going on we know what's happening you know we heard we heard um nandy's testimony earlier i mean she really is it, what it sounds like everybody who does this work is called to do this work pastor you know what i'm talking about here right everybody in this work you gotta be a pastor or a reverend they're called to do this work yeah. they do it from their heart and from their spirit and from their soul and, and in order to better a community and so when asking for what, what you're saying you know tomorrow say this is basically asking for minimum we're not asking for maximum i mean we're asking for minimum and the fact that we're begging for minimum right. is like 
infuriating be, when, when we think about the larger scape of things and, and, and what's happening. And that's just, it's just very, it's just very real. It's very uh-huh. troublesome as well because it's very yeah. troublesome. It's very troublesome because like you said, this job as home, as home visitor or parent educator, it's a passion project. So that's you're right. doing it out of passion. You're doing it out of work. Like you're doing it out of something that's from your heart. You're going in and you're connected with families, whether they are on this, whether they're on parole or anything, you're connecting, trying to reestablish, help people reestablish a life. Yes. And establishing a life, you also have your own struggles as your own individual. So as right. a worker, you can't even afford to park in these people's neighborhood or the anxiety of parking or, or the anxiety of going in to these That's environments. Right. But you actually are going with your heart. You're not thinking with your mind. So you're going in to help these families reestablish themselves. You're going to help the single mother who I have a client who recently had a, her, her mares were off. She's a bipolar sufferer. And she had to give her daughter to someone so that she can go into a hospital. You know, you're going in to help that mom. But That's even right. though that we can barely make a little bit over minimum wage. Right. We can barely have the resources at our jobs or at our organizations to be able to supplement gas. So even if that couldn't increase on salary, that could increase compensation to the person, to the home aid person who's going in. That can increase them, to, you know, education, training. That money can go towards that. If it can't go towards salary, then it will at least put them in a position where they can better themselves in their career, where mm-hmm. they can where they can do better. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Pastor Davis, did you want to add to that? Oh, it's definitely true. Uh, I, I I just automatically thought of my mom's when I would watch her get on the bus to go and help elderly people off her little salary that she had. And she she gave up a lot of her hopes and dreams to help other people. She could have just left and went to, you know, finished her education, made good money, but she kept her family together and she kept working to help people. And as a result of that, a lot of times, the person that do that, they suffer the most because they, they don't, like she used to say, give me my flowers now. And here I am giving them to her right now, saying to myself, we got to we got to change something. The dynamics have to change. We have to stop. We have to stop trying to do. And I like what I saw. We need to stop treating stuff to stop preventing it. Mm-hmm. And the only way we're going to do that, we're going to have to get ahead of the curve. So it's going to take some of this money that's sitting around so that we can help some of these organizations and some of these single people do something to make a difference. Yeah. I always like to say, I don't know what would would, would make the difference, but doing the exact same thing is not going (laughs) to Isn't it? It, 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 Doing the same thing or, you know, a piece or it's, it's, yes, that part, that part to it, but also doing the same thing, expecting a different result, but also not listening to people with real lot lived experience and people on the ground. You know what I mean? Right. The question is, who, who is your constituency? Who are you listening to? Who, who, who are you listening to? And, and how are you responding to those who you're listening to and, and prioritizing those? And, and you all are in prevention work. That's and so- right. The greatest thing we could do is li- listen to those who are pre- who are doing the prevention work, because that's, um, that's who knows. I mean, and I say that for that's in every in every avenue, no matter what. If if you want to learn about you know how to improve anything in the city, you got to go to the per- people who do it. I don't want to go to right. you don't go to, to the director. If somebody you 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 want to improve how we take out how trash is done or anything, you go to somebody who you go to the driver. If you want to include bus service, you talk to the bus operator. And if we want to improve outcomes in the District of Columbia, we got to talk to our prevention workers. And here what, right. what, what is being said is to our prevention workers are saying, look, we can't do prevention work if we can't survive. That's if right. We live. And we want to be able to give of our passion, of our heart, of, of our soul, the way we do. But we want to be able to also just ha- have our basic needs met. Um, and that should be something that is prioritized and listened to uh, as a whole. And if you do that, then we will see the work of prevention working. And we won't have to look around and say, well, what's happening in our community? What, where's all this coming from? Because we'll, we'll, we'll have done the work to, to stop it from happening. Um, and we got to stop wasting, you know, waste, wasting, wasting money and wasting time doing the same thing and not listening to the people who are on the ground, who are really doing the work. Um, and I know all of us who grew up here in D.C., so we know it's like we yeah. look, we know what works. We've been through it. We've seen it. We've seen cycles of this time and time. Yep. Um, over and over again. 
over and over again, you know? And so what does that mean for us and, and how we how we move and how we show up? So um, I appreciate both of you all's testimony, the work and service you do. I'm going to try to do my part um, in trying to figure out how we balance this budget in a way that shows that we really truly care about prevention and prevention workers uh, and the work you do and, and also the dignity that you deserve in, in having your basic needs met um, and, and the work that you all are able to do. So thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule and of your time to testify today. Really appreciate it. For anybody who testified, please, uh, we need your testimony so that it can be a part of the record. Um, as we make decisions on budget, we need to be able to substantiate those decisions with evidence that is your testimony. Okay. Uh, so please make sure you submit it to our committee at facilities at dccouncil.gov uh, um, before uh, uh, on or before April 19th is the final uh, testimony uh, time that we will be accepting uh, testimony. Um, our uh, hearing, we will um, conclude this hearing for today in one second, I will tap us out. But before I do that, we will be reconvening uh, tomorrow at 9 a.m. 9 a.m. We will be reconvening tomorrow at 9 a.m. Uh, with our government witnesses. We will hear uh, uh, from uh, our directors of, of both of our agencies uh, that we uh, from CFSA and the Office of Ombudsman for Children. Uh, so thank you, everyone of our public witnesses who testified today. Uh, thank you uh, to our council staff and committee staff uh, for getting us through the day. Uh, and don't forget to submit your testimony at facilities at dccouncil.gov by close of business on April 19th. The time is 2.52 p.m. and this hearing is adjourned.